Hey, what's going on, everybody? Welcome. It's Tuesday. You know what that means. It's time for the Jeff Gersman Show. It's a podcast about video games. I'm here to host this week's episode of the show. My name is Jeff Gerstman. I have um, just a, you know, a little bit about me. I, I have uh, been playing video games um, for the last uh, three years. And uh, I think they're cool. I don't know. I think they're they're a whole lot of fun. I love to uh, you know just my some of my bona fides. I uh, I I know uh, how I'm never I'm never sus, and I always thank the bus driver. Thank you for having me here on the program. Um, it's been a <laughs> interesting couple of days uh, around here. I uh, I had to um. If you've, I, I've been moving things over to the, uh, to my storage locker here for, I don't know, you know, when, when I can, you know, when, when I, when I get a little bit of time and I can, I can load up the car real quick and drive it over there. And I've been, uh, it's, I, I take my, I drive my wife's car cause my wife drives my car. Well, what, I mean, who, you know, what are cars, right? I mean, they're our cars. Um, but you know, the, the one that I was driving and commuting in fits baby seats and stuff better. So she's been driving that primarily. And so I've been, been driving her little kind of compact car here whenever I, you know, need to go somewhere. And so not, neither car fits much in the way of boxes of goods. So, uh, you know, taking a compact car over the storage locker, not that big of a deal. Um, it started acting up a little bit and I was like looking at it going like, mm, this is either the battery or the alternator. I'm pretty sure it's probably the alternator. I really got to take this in and, uh, and get it dealt with. Um, Monday morning, no Sunday morning. I, uh, decided to like, just like a quick, you know, she was, she was out with the kids for a little bit. So I'm like, I'm just going to make a quick run over here to the, storage locker so i loaded up uh, a box full of rock band instruments a box full of duffel bags including one for the game dark void and one that had an epic games logo on it those are the only ones that, those were the ones on the top um and a couple other boxes one had like a one had the uh the remember the the move controller light gun thing that sony made that was like had the the bulb for the move controller on the end of it and and you know the one had that in there Anyway, driving over to the storage locker, it's not that far, you know, it's a, it's a, it's a relatively quick drive, you know, it's a few freeway exits. It's not, you know, um, I'm getting off the road, I'm driving over there and then the battery light is on. The battery light has been on occasionally off and on for the past, like few times I've driven it, but I only drive it like once every two weeks. So it's easy to just like, not really think about it. Um, and, uh, as I'm pulling, as I'm turning my hard right into the parking lot of the storage place, I noticed that power steering has died. I'm like, oh, oh, okay. This is happening now. All right. Okay. Uh, and then the, the car done. Um, I was like, cool, man. Cool. Um, so I managed to get it into a parking space and had to call. I had just got, uh, you know, like roadside assistance from, uh, you know, tri triple a triple a in Southern California is a totally different company or, or totally different membership than Northern California. So if you move down here, uh, and you have it already, you don't have it. <laughs> so, uh, so there, anyway, I had just recently gotten it because I was like, I, I just forgot and, and finally remembered and gotten it. So. I ended up calling them and they came over uh, originally they were going to tow it. And I was like, well, what about, you know, is it, is it, do I need a battery or do I need a battery swap or do I need to tow it? I don't really know. And he's like, well, I could send the battery truck. I'm like, I guess, I don't know. What do you think? He said, yeah, I'll send the battery truck. But the battery truck take, took way longer, but, uh, he came over, juiced up the battery and then he looked at it. So like, yeah, man, I'm going to follow you to make sure you make it back home. Because if this is, uh, what it looks like, then, uh, then yeah, you got, you gotta, you gotta do some stuff. I'm like, all right, cool. Um, and then sure enough, pulling back into the driveway, same deal. 
power steering just dies. I almost like pitched it up onto the lawn because I'm like, whoa, 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 whoa. I did. I need to put muscle into turning the car all of a sudden. It's not like, you know, I used to drive, you know, when you drive old cars that didn't have power steering, it's like whatever. But something about a car that has power steering and that power steering is no longer working is like way harder than a car that never had it to begin with, which I that's like you're never going to. No one's ever going to experience that because who no one's going to drive old cars anymore. Um, if Jay Leno is listening, he's like, yeah, that's right. Yeah, yeah that's, that's, that's just how it works. Um, but uh, yeah, so anyway, the, yesterday I had to get a towed over to a shop. I had to find a shop, uh, you know, because we, you know, moved and um, didn't have a shop to, to go to. So I had to figure out, like, are these guys going to be reliable? I don't know. They seem, I, they're attached to a smog place that I went to and I liked them. Turns out not the same owner. <laughs> it's just next door neighbors. I'm like, well, whatever. Brought it in there. And, um, I am away. It, it will supposedly be ready today. Um, but it's, they, they were getting like, you know, cause they, you know, car shops, I don't know. They have racks. They'll put the cars up on racks to work under them. And he's like, well, you know, of course, Monday I'm getting a couple of racks replaced. So it might take a while. And then sure enough, they didn't even call me to give me an estimate until this morning. So whatever. Um, the estimate seems a little high, but I, you know, as someone who was gr grown up, uh, with, you know, parents who ran, still run an auto repair business, uh, that was, it was, it's more money than I thought it would be. I was like, I think it's like 150 bucks to buy a new alternator. And they're like, ah, oh, your bat, your, your battery's bad too. And you know, you sh while we're in here, we could replace this belt. I'm like, sure, whatever. Anyway, so they were hitting me for like a grand for new battery, alternator, uh, belt, labor. I'm like, eh, maybe that's okay. I don't know. Yeah, that's like, yeah, maybe that's fine. Um, but yeah, so I don't know. At some point I got to like go pick that up uh, when, whenever that gets finished. But uh, yeah, I don't know. So that's, I got to get it finished because I got to get these boxes over to this storage locker. This baby is going to be born in October. So there's not a lot of, you know, we don't need to, we don't need to finish. I don't need to be completely out of this room by the day the the baby is born or, or anything like that. But, um, you know, I'm trying to, trying to make as much progress as I can, uh, because you know, I, well, time is getting tight. I don't know. I guess that's, that's my long winded way of saying like, man, it's been, uh, yeah, it's, it's, uh, you know, we're, we're getting down to it. There's a lot of like, okay, we got to pack a hospital bag, like all this st stuff again. Uh, which, you know, we did two years ago now, just about, uh, and, and yeah, we're, we're, we're getting ready to, to go through it again. It has been really fast this last, you know, eight months or whatever it's been. And, um, and yeah, and I don't know how many of that's going to go, you know, it's like, whatever, I, you know, I still have health care at the moment. I gotta, I think I, I think I will have to get a new plan at the end of the year because I'm still technically on the plan i'm still technically on cobra which is like when they when they remove you from a job you they they you are allowed to keep their health care for a period of time i'm still within that window um and uh you say cobra is expensive you should see what the fuck i mean it's the exact same plan that i would have had as an as an employee of the company so it's, it's, you think that's expensive. You should see what it will cost when I am not on Cobra for a family of four and about to be five. But when I last looked it up, it was a family of four. And I was like, oh, this is, this is, you want, you want $4,000 every month for the, the, that's what, what? Uh, and so, yeah, um, Working solo has, uh, is a very interesting eye-opening experience in a lot of ways. Um, but yes, uh, that is, uh, over double what I am paying for Cobra. <laughs> so anyway, whatever healthcare continues to be a disaster in the United States. 
and um, it shouldn't be. I don't know. That's I don't have a like a long winded platform of advocacy for healthcare. Um, I think that it should be better. I think the there's been a really good long running campaign where people in the U S have convinced themselves through whatever propaganda or, you know, whatever it was, um, that, Oh, well, Canada and UK. Yeah. Maybe they don't pay for healthcare, but you're going to be waiting in line for four years. Every time you get a cold, like people have convinced themselves that like, Oh, that national national stuff. Is, yep. Yeah. Well, if you need a surgery, get in line, I guess like everyone has become, in the U.S. has convinced themselves that this is the only way it can. Not everyone, but a lot of people have have like this weird, really weird take on um on how healthcare works in the United Kingdom and in Canada. They're like, well, I read a thing that said that. Yeah, I bet you did. I bet you did. Uh. And not to say that those healthcare systems are great. And I know in the UK, they're trying to fuck it over. They're trying really hard to fuck up the UK healthcare system even worse. Um, but Jesus. Um, yeah, yeah, exactly. Like as if, as if like healthcare here is like, it's expensive, but you definitely get seen and everything gets taken care of. Nothing bad's going to happen to you because the healthcare is so good because you're paying so much money for it. Like, no, like I, you know, I'm, I'm going to see. I'm going back to my, my wife got me seeing dermatologists because she, uh, she always saw them. And, and, you know, I think she had some stuff that ran in her family that, that, you know, made it reason like it's a good idea for her to get checked out on a regular basis. This was something I'd never, had, I'd never seen a dermatologist in my life. Um, and, uh, and I'm due to, to go back and, and, you know, get looked at or, or whatever, like making the, the appointment. Like I'm going this week. This appointment had to be booked a month and a half ago. You know, like the call was put in a month and a half ago. Hey, we'd like to come in and see. Like, okay, we got some time in mid-August. Like, fucking really? If you can even get anyone on the phone. That's been the other thing of my wife being pregnant is obviously there's a lot of phone calls and a lot of like booking stuff to see a, a, to see doctors and, and see all of this other shit. And every time, every time she picks up the phone to call somebody, no one fucking even answers the phone. And they're like, well, you have to get this test between 30 weeks and 32 weeks or whatever. Like, like pregnant tests are weird. They're like, they have to happen in this exact window or else we can't do them. And all this. And then you're like, okay, I can't even get you on the phone to make the fucking appointment. <laughs> like, and, and then... When I get you on the phone, they're like, oh, geez, he's not here this week. And then he's booked up this week. And then this and this and this. And you're like, well, okay, he's the one who told me to come in between this period and this period. So you fucking tell me what to do. Uh, it's, it's bad. It's bad. I, it's, it's, yeah. The thing about um, going through the, the pregnancy stuff again is also this kind of like reminder about I, I it really feels like a lot of the um healthcare best practices and stuff around pregnancy are super dated and not at all like like no one can, like when a woman is uncomfortable and maybe this goes for all of society and not just this specific situation but when a woman is having a problem um, they're just like, yeah, I don't know. Uh, yeah, it, that, that, that do be happening. Like, oh yeah, you will itch sometimes. Oh yeah. No, that you will feel sick for nine months for, for eight months. So that's too bad. Oh, you haven't, you haven't, the morning sickness hasn't let up yet. That's weird. That normally lets up for people. Anyway, it's like, it's real crazy how willing they are to just be like, yeah, fucking, I don't know. Just, uh, hang you know, like, yeah, we're not going to, you know, we do anything. If you complain enough, we'll eventually figure something out, I guess. But it's real weird. It's real, real weird. <laughs> um, it's the stuff that you think is just like, man, you think that this stuff would be like, not necessarily like state of the art or whatever, but like, hey, there's got to be something um, 
there's got to be something that, that uh, you know, we could be smarter about, better about, whatever. Um, and yeah, I don't know. It's, I, I don't, for the amount of money that has to be paid in this stuff. Like if I was still on Kaiser, look, when I was growing up, I was on Kaiser and Kaiser sucks. Uh, in my, in my experience, Kaiser is really good until you actually need something. Um, like if you just, if you're a, uh, if you're a healthy person and you're not pregnant and you're not doing anything and you just like need to like occasionally see a doctor once every year or two and you're like, they're great. You don't have to fucking, you know, like they're awesome. You go in there, you see a doctor and, and they're just like, yeah, you're fine. Whatever. Here's some, you need some drugs. Here's drugs. Um, but the minute you actually need anything, that shit sucks. That shit sucks. Anyway. Um, long story short, healthcare is, it's terrible. It's, it, it really is. It really is terrible. I, I, and I'm, I am in a great, you know, I, I am in a position where I can afford to pay for healthcare for my family and, and all of that sort of stuff. And I'm still over here going to this service. Like it's still bad. It's still, it's, it's not like I'm over here going like, <laughs> yeah, well, it's, yeah, well, I can afford, you know, it, even, even when you can afford to pay for it, it is still shit service. It's bad. I don't know. It's, it's, uh, They should change it, he says, as if there isn't like billions, if not trillions of dollars of interests lined up on the other side of keeping this shit exactly the same way it is forever and ever and ever. Like, can people get Adderall? People, can people who need Adderall find it or is it still nowhere? Is it still like, oh yeah, what? That drug that you uh, have been prescribed by a medical professional? <laughs> yeah, we ain't got that. Like, what? Fucking what? That make fucking more. Like, mmm. Mmm. <laughs> Fuck me, man. It's, mmm. It's bad. They should, uh, they should... <laughs> That they should make it better. We should make. How do we make it better? We vote. I mean, like, yeah, okay. I'll keep voting. I'm not going to not vote. But uh, doesn't feel like it's. Uh, feel like either party necessarily. Uh, one party is actively trying to kill people. The other party is passively trying to do. Hmm. Uh, Anyway, America, uh, it, it, the, in, in much better news, in fantastic news, if you, you look, maybe you can't afford health care. Maybe you think the world is uh, falling down, falling apart. I personally, I see reasons for hope. Sometimes it can always feel like, ah, oh, geez. We're done. This is it. There's, if it's not climate change, it's this. If it's not this, it's that. If it's not this, it's that. And I, I, it can be very easy to feel like, um, you know, a level of doom around you. I get it. Sometimes I feel that way, but I, I always feel like there's, you know, there are things we can change. It's always the things where you got to start at a kind of a local level and work your way up or whatever. But I, you know, I don't think there's a lot of reasons to feel pure doom, especially with the release of quake two. Fuck doom. Quake two is here, motherfucker. And they've remastered it. It's fantastic. Holy shit. This came out alongside quake con. Um, they, you know, you may remember that they remastered and released a new version of Quake 1 and put it out on consoles a while ago. Well, now it is Quake 2's time. Uh, I love Quake 2. Is Quake 2's multiplayer better than Quake 1's multiplayer? I that's a that's a lengthy debate that I'm not really looking to have here. I will say that I love Quake 2's multiplayer or I love mods for Quake 2's multiplayer. And I played so, 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 so much Quake 2. Um, 
And so this version they've released has like the expansion pack campaigns in there. It also has the Qu uh, the N64 version of Quake 2. They put that campaign in there, which I I, I did see at some point in the past. I don't I don't I don't know. I couldn't remember a damn thing about it, but it's in there. And that's kind of awesome because now you can play that. They, I think, believe they did the same thing with um, with uh, Quake One as they put the Quake sixty four uh, stuff into that game as well. Um, and it's awesome if you already own Quake Two on Steam. It is now the new version of Quake Two. Um, you can play it with a mouse and keyboard. It has cross play now, which is great because you can get the fuck online with your mouse and your keyboard, and you can play against people that are on an Xbox. And it's just like when they released Quake 3 on the Dreamcast and you could you could hook a mouse and keyboard up to the Dreamcast and have a broadband adapter and murder everyone. That's fun. Um, the problem is, I think the server browser is real bad. It's not so much a server browser as it is, here's a list of servers and all we're going to tell you is the map currently running, the mode currently running, your ping, and the number of players. Uh but you can't sort that or sift through it in any meaningful way. Every time I've lo loaded it up, there've always been a handful of servers running, um, but they come and go at, at this. They please because they're not dedicated servers. There's some dude on an Xbox saying, how do I start a thing? And, and then starting up a server. Um, and so, you know, you'll play one match and then someone will quit halfway through the, the server host will quit halfway through. And then you're like, Oh, I guess that's that. Um, but I really, I miss, I miss Quake 2 mods. Quake 2 mods, I feel, were, for me, Quake 2 was the height of shooter modding. I think that, that is when a lot of stuff happened. Obviously, you know, when, when Half-Life kind of came along, a lot of stuff happened there as well, clearly. <laughs> um, but Quake 2, there was just a ton of stuff and it felt like it was happening all the time. With Quake 2, when it was at its kind of height of popularity back then, it felt like there was a new mod coming out every week. And you were you were finding a server that was playing it. You were down, downloading the, the parts that you needed and, and getting on. And, and you were playing, you know, Action Quake 2 or whatever. And, and that was one that was designed to be like, what if you could do John Woo shit in Quake? And it's clunky and weird, but also it's fucking awesome. There was also an action Half-Life, which is, you know, same people. Uh, yeah, Jailbreak. I always am talking about Jailbreak. Jailbreak was a mod where when you died, you tell you, you respawned in, in jail. And if the entire team went to jail, they lost. But if you got enough players in the jail, not all of them, but like enough to where you could stand on each other and like do this elaborate hopping and hop and, and, and boost other people over the wall, they could get out. And if anyone ever got to that jail, there was a button on it you could hit to free everybody. Um, so you would you would boost a guy over the wall, and then he would hit the button and free everybody. And it was like, ah, that's so good, it's so good. Um, but for me, it, you know, I I want uh, I want Rocket Arena. I want I want Rocket Arena Two, the Quake Two version of Rocket Arena, which basically turned the game into a it was it was it was one v one. It was like they made custom small maps for it. And then players who were not actively participating in that 1v1 fight could spectate from above. And so you would kind of wait your turn, almost like a fighting game. Um, and I just, I, I, I loved that. Um, and, uh, you know, the, the, the DLLs and stuff have changed. So it's not, you know, old mods don't necessarily directly work on new Quake 2. Um, but with quake one over time, they did eventually like roll in some official kind of official mods and I would love for them to put RA two in there. Um, you know, on, on consoles and, and everything else, like, like releasing that officially, I think that would be super cool. I would love to see that either way though. Um, it's a solid version of quake two. And the music fucking rips. How long has it been since you've heard the Quake 2 soundtrack? Probably too long. Um, does it, it doesn't have the ray tracing stuff in the RTX version. It, I don't... It, the video options are weirdly uh, slim. And so, no, it does not have the... That's maybe the one thing I would say is like, it's kind of strange that it's missing that stuff. Um... 
but yeah, I don't know. I, I like Quake 2. They've, there's like new AI behaviors and some other weird shit like that. Like there, there's there's kind of cool. It, it's it's cool. Um, and it's fun to have like a, a one that you can easily play multiplayer on and reach a variety of kind of like modern players and, and, and such. Um, and so, yeah, I don't know. I, I'm, I had a really great time with it. I'm, I'm going to keep that installed for a, a good long time and, uh, and you know, we'll see how long people keep playing it. I would love to see some updates to make the server browser just like better, you know, easier to sort. Just let me sort it by ping time. Like, what the fuck is wrong? You know, like I gotta, I gotta scroll down because everyone is just running their own server off their own console or whatever. It's like some dude on a wireless connected Xbox, who knows where in the world, and you just look at it and it says like 230. I'm not connecting to that server. I'm looking for one that's at least 50 or under. And you know, if you're lucky, you'll find one. Um. So yeah, like that stuff could be better. I don't know what they what they've done in terms of like allowing dedicated servers to run on this kind of updated architecture or, or whatever, that would be kind of cool. But, um, but yeah, I guess you could always just install actual fucking quake Two. I found myself this. So this led to me staring at like quake Two source ports and going like, well, what do I, are there any, and then there are not nearly as many as there were for quake one, um, for starters. And there was one that was called like quake Two XP. It looked like it had been updated a year ago. Like it didn't seem like any of them were being actively maintained from, from what I could find. And maybe there's still one out there that I, I didn't find, but, um, yeah, is, is Yamagi quake two updated? I, that was on the list. I don't know that I looked at that one, but there was a lot of stuff that just felt like it was, um, had been kind of thrown by the wayside. Like people said, like, I'm going to make a source port of quake two. And then they like, nah, nah, I'm good. Um, Taste some people in chat are saying Tasty Spleen has a good Quake 2 starter pack for multiplayer. Hmm. The other dark road this led me down, which is I don't know how this I don't I don't my I don't I don't know how my brain works. No one really knows how their brain works. Um so I was like, well, I wonder what I, I wonder what how Quake 4 is these days. What's up with Quake 4? Uh, and so I installed Quake 4 and I found um, the the config file edits I would need to make in order to run Quake 4 at 2560 by 1440 um, and jumped onto a Quake 4 server uh, and found myself in a match with two other humans that were out there playing Quake 4. <laughs> Uh, and I don't think either of them were at QuakeCon, but, uh, Quake 4, I would, I so I, you know, I remember, I remember Quake 4 being like kind of whatever when it came out, you know, Quake 3 came out and people, you know, there was definitely an aspect of Quake 3 where people were like, you know, it doesn't have a real campaign, you know, the, the, the campaign mode, the single player is just you playing against bots in, in multiplayer matches. And that people were kind of lightly disappointed by that, but also Quake 3's multiplayer is so fucking good that no one really cared. <laughs> you know, but it was like, there was a mild like, that's kind of unfortunate. That's, that's, man, that seems like there should be a campaign in this. And then, uh, uh but no one fucking cared. <laughs> at the end of the day people were like no it's this is the best this is the best one of these that's ever been made it's unfortunate that it maybe it doesn't have a campaign i guess but i know uh, we're good we're okay uh yeah we'll install team arena we'll play that too who cares we're yeah fine so when quake 4 came out they build it as the sequel to quake 2 because from a storyline perspective it takes it back to like the strong and all this other weird shit and and um, and it has a, a full on campaign. They spoiled the twist in the campaign. I want to say on the back of the box, if not in one of the trailers or, or were like screenshot, I know, but I know pre-release they were showing screenshots that were definitely like, here is your human player character on a conveyor belt getting turned into Strog. And you're like, oh, 
so okay so i'm gonna be turned into half alien at some point here and sure enough yeah you you do eventually get turned into the strong and, and you get some some kind of powers on the other side of that um i reviewed that game i guess but i remember that game being all right um but th i remember the multiplayer being like actually kind of disappointing because it felt like it was just quake 3 with bad additions um it was like, hey, here's here's pretty much the Quake 3 multiplayer, but worse. And the maps are worse. That's how I remember. <laughs> that's how I remember the Quake 4 uh, multiplayer going down. It was just like, yeah, this doesn't, I don't know. This I would much rather play Quake 3. Those maps are better and everything, you know, and all that sort of stuff. So, um, so yeah, I don't know. I, I just, but I've, I found myself in this weird, like, I just wanted to see Quake 4 multiplayer. Because I mostly just want to see the maps and stuff. I'm like, oh, they put new weapon, they put different weapons in it, didn't they? They changed some stuff up, and yeah, they they sort of did. Um, but it's a uh, it's a weird game, Quake Four. So much so that yeah, I think there are a lot of people in the chat right now. They're saying, oh, I didn't even know they made a Quake Four. Yeah, it's it was not you know Activision published it, and it, it kind of just was um, kind of whatever. It was just, it was just kind of whatever. Um, yeah. And then over on the unreal, on the, on the unreal side, you know, they were trying to double down on big team games with like a larger number of players. And, you know, they were like, what if we put vehicles in here and you can like all the onslaught stuff. And I, you know, that was not what I liked. I like unreal just fine, but I, I don't like that part of unreal. I like playing just straight up deathmatch and all that other stuff. I don't even, you know, I'm, I'm not a big CTF guy. So that's the thing. Like, you know, everyone talks about like the, like, do you like Unreal's CTF or do you like three wave CTF on Quake or, you know, whatever. And like, I, you know, that stuff. I did not want to play any team, anything then. It wasn't really until 2007 when um, Call of Duty 4 came out and made team deathmatch kind of the default mode that I kind of begr begrudgingly started playing team games. Um, and then with Quake, yeah, Quake Champions came along, Quake Live came along. I, you know, there's some weird part of me that probably like either Quake Live is a, there's a more purity to that experience than Quake Champions. Quake Champions is all free to play it up in a bunch of weird ways. And I, I don't know. Also, Maybe, I don't know. I, it's probably worse now, but I feel like the only people playing Quake Champions were um, absolute murderers. I I had a, a terrible time. <laughs> I had a terrible time uh, playing Quake Champions because the people that were playing it were just too fucking good at Quake and good on them. Um, but like, it was just like, it was to a point where it was just like, I'm never going to dig out of this hole because every time I spawn, I'm dead again. And this is fucking fucked. Um, which is weird because, you know, I, I connected to that quake four server and you got to figure anyone still playing quake four is probably pretty fucking great. And the people that we're playing were significantly better than I am, but, uh, I still got some kills in. I still, I still did, did a little bit of work. Um, so I don't know. I don't know how that, how, how that whole thing goes. Um, anyway, Quake 2, it's out now. You should, uh, you should check out Quake 2. Um, it's a hell of a game. Uh, the third Baldur's Gate game, uh, also is, uh, you know, kind of in the news, I suppose. Um, yeah, I, I ended up playing the first few hours of this and streaming it. And it was kind of enough for me to realize like, yeah, this, this seems incredibly well made, but it's just not, I'm not, I'm not looking for that style of turn-based combat, whatever it is, just like top to bottom. It was this feeling of just like, yeah, I don't, I don't really, I'm not really interested in a D and D game, uh, in, in this day and age. So, um, so whatever. Uh, but yeah, it, it's, I, I, I'm the, a lot of the discussion around Baldur's Gate three has been poisoned by some real dumb shit. Um, and <laughs> you know, this has been happening for a few weeks now, but I, you know, it kind of got, I felt it felt like it got stirred up 
all over again over the past 48 hours or so. I, you know, IGN posted a thing that a lot of people have been reacting to and being like, this is, you are wrong about this. Um, and it's become this weird cudgel, like, like it has become this like weird talking point in this weird perceived battle about the quality of shipping games in this day and age. And, um, it's really weird to see Baldur's Gate, a game that was in early access for three years, um, and in development for years prior to that early access release, um, being held up as like, this is how all games should be. Why aren't all games like this? Why are developers, why are the money hungry? And, and, and it's just, it's, it's really crazy. Like people are divorcing themselves from reality to make this argument that Baldur's Gate three is like the high water mark for everything. And also, uh, every other developer should do this as if that's a thing they could do. And in the grand scheme of things around like bugs and buggy launches and everything else, we're in this position where, okay, yeah, uh, Baldur's Gate, you know, they were able to do early access and, and, and able to um, get years of player feedback and also years of player money in that allowed them the time to work on that game. Um, which a lot of games don't. If you think that every game should be released in early access ahead of time, in order to suck up money from players that are hoping that a game will be good, then I, that's an argument I suppose you could have. Um, but I, I don't know that I think that that's uh, a road forward for the entire industry per se. We're also currently at a point where there's a lot of, like I saw something that Larian was basically saying like, Try to do long rests as often as you can in the act, especially in the third act, because it will reduce bugs. Like they're out there still working on fixes and issuing hot fixes and doing all of this other stuff for a game that, that for whatever reason is being held up as just like this game should ship bug free. It's like, yeah, no, I mean, Hey, yeah, I, I agree with you as someone who is fucking, I, that has been a platform I have run on for a lot of years around these parts, but it's just not realistic in this day and age. Um, and so it's cool that Baldur's Gate has come out and, you know, like after all these years of fixes and all this years of updates and everything else, it's come out and people love it. It, it is... I mean, it's awesome that this came out and, and it's, it's going to make for a really interesting thing at the end of the year here, right? Where like, I think there, you had a lot of people that were like, oh, Tears of the Kingdom is definitely game of the year. And now this feels like the only other game that I think has come along that is going to contend with that. And, and, you know, at least in the overall kind of conversation, um, when we talk about big outlets and, and, you know, the who played what and whatever else, like I, you know, I bet we will be in a situation where more people will have played Zelda than have played Baldur's Gate. Starfield, Starfield's out in a month. I'm not talking about it. I mean, maybe, yeah, maybe Starfield will contend with this. This is the first game that is out that is contended with this. Um, and so, I don't know, there, there's been uh, a lot of, you know, some developers, um, uh, Chet uh, Falzek from, uh, I'm, I'm pronouncing his last name wrong. I probably am. Um, you know, who's a uh, long, old, old man Murray through to Valve and, you know, worked on Left 4 Dead is now uh, working on the Anacrusis. Uh, Will Smith is also on that, but you know, he, he's got a TikTok account where he's been posting like a lot of fascinating little kind of tidbits and stories about, you know, kind of his time at valve, uh, not in like a jerk sort of way, like, you know, calling other people, you know, just like, oh yeah, here's, here's how this stuff happened. And here's how games are funny. And here's how writing funny games is hard. And, you know, it's like a lot of interesting stuff. And I think, you know, because, you know, they've gone through the early access process. They're still going through the early access process with their game right now. You know, he, he kind of was like, Hey, here's, you know, here's why this is also, you know, kind of pointed out that, you know, we're talking about this IGN video. Meanwhile, IGN reviewed the early access version of the game 
years ago and gave it like a seven out of 10 and called it, you know, Bucky. <laughs> You're like, okay. Uh, which, you know, so a lot from the developer end, I think we're seeing this kind of other larger conversation spawn out of this about like, early access reviews are those good are those bad are the you know like are those are those hurting games uh that are out there trying to get feedback from players so that they can improve themselves and i think that's where we wander into a really um a really weird gray area um around like what are people doing when they play when they when they pay for a game what are reviewers doing when they're reviewing a game? When should a reviewer review a game? How often should that review be updated? I think that's the that's the stuff that we started running into um, as games started getting more meaningful updates, whether those were big patches. Um, back in the GameSpot days, we would wait until an, an expansion dropped. So like when the World of Warcraft expansion would come out or when the Diablo, you know, whatever when an expansion would come out for a PC game, because that's how it used to be. Uh, and it was a thing in a box you could pay for, or a thing you could pay for, I suppose, is, is really the, the point. Then you could revisit it and say like, okay, here's how, the, um, here's how this expansion is. And also it, it gives us time to talk about, hey, the game has also received a lot of patches. So it's a better game today than it is yesterday. And, and you know, like, or, or you know, whatever. Um, but it's a time to revisit the game. It's like a, a good kind of line in the sand to say like, okay, they're, they're coming to you and saying, spend 40 more dollars on this. Now what? Nowadays, um, games are updated all the time. We have some games that try to, to say they're in early access and that they're not done yet. And yet they're charging full price for them. And so as a review, as a, as a reviewer that is attempting to help an audience spend money on video games a attempting to, to help them be smarter about where they're placing their dollars. Um, I think you have to, at some point review early access games because people are going to ask Oh, should I get this? You know, like Baldur's gate three was a big deal when it came out years ago, when it first started early access, people were like, Oh my God, you know, and, and it was missing a ton. You know, obviously it's, it's missing a ton of stuff. It took them years to get it to this, this spot. Um, and so people want to know, hey, is this thing any good? And so I think it is, it is a perfectly valid form of work to say yes or, or, or no. I think it is a perfectly valid, you know, to, to say like, hey, you know, this, this amount of money is this. And, and, you know, yeah, if they're, if they're coming here and they're asking $40, $60, whatever it is. I think it is perfectly valid for someone to weigh in on that critically and not say, oh, well, we're not going to touch it because it's in early access. I think you have to kind of, I think when you're approaching early access content, like the, the acts, the, the ideal way to do it is impossible to do nowadays because the ideal way to do it would be okay. We're going to review this game in early access. And we, th by doing so, we are creating a pact with our audience, not with the game developers. Like that's, you know, ultimately we are here to serve the audience and not the industry. But we are creating that pact with the audience and saying, we will keep you up to date on this. If this game is updated, we will update our review accordingly. And so I think, you know, the idea that like a game and, you know, IGN does this because resources, no one has the resources to actually do that across the number of games that are in early access at any given time. No one has time to keep tabs on that and go like, oh, well, whatever. Okay. Well, well oh, they, there's a new patch for, for this game. There's a new patch for this. And so we, we have to, now we can, we, we can reassess this. No one is allowed to have staff sizes large enough to take on that task. Um, if you're a solo, like I, you know, if I wanted to devote myself to reviewing patches of games, like, yeah, sure. I could say like, I'm going to be the destiny guy. I could, I'm not going to do that. Um, but large outlets can't really afford to dedicate people to that sort of stuff. Right. And so, you know, it creates the situation where like, 
the people at these professional outlets want to try to serve an audience and they're chasing the largest audience they can because it's a business. Um, and so they have to place bets and go like, oh, we're going to review this. We're not going to review this. We're not going to touch this. Um, we're, we're only going to touch this and we're going to update this when we can. You know, we're doing this early access review because it's hot right now. And so traffic dictates we should do this. But then like, and that's where it gets into actually you start doing the developers a disservice where you're like, hey, uh, yeah, we reviewed this game four years ago. Th this is, you know, the, the review on GameSpot that they used to get a bunch of shit about was League of Legends, which is not necessarily an early access situation, but they reviewed it when it came in a box. They reviewed it when... It came out and it was sold and they were like, eh, well, I don't remember the exact review, but I remember they were, they were kind of down on it. And, um, every time anyone there in any capacity had to have a conversation with riot, riot would be like, oh yeah, we would buy ads. What the fuck is up with your fucking review? Like, what the fuck? You know, like, you know they would be like, what the, you know? And, and so like, what do you do with a changing game like that? League of legends is probably big enough that you could devote someone to re-reviewing it over and over again. Um, but a lot of games are not. And I think in those cases, you know, if you're just going to review an early access game once and never loop back around to see if it's been updated until it hits 1.0 and you're going to let that review sit there for a year or more, that is not at some point that provides negative value. That might be good in the moment. That might be good when people are like, uh, you know, hey, people, people want to know about this game right here, right now. And you're like, okay. But like six months down the line, is that early access review going to matter to anyone? It doesn't serve the audience anymore because the game has been updated in ways that make your review invalid. It negatively impacts the developer because you're talking about a lot of problems the game might have and might not have anymore. Which, you know, you want to be accurate. That's not a, we have to protect the developers. We have to work with them. There are, that's a, you want to be accurate for your audience. Um, and so it almost becomes a thing of like, oh, should you post an early access review and then remove it? Um, should you, you know, what is the right answer on that? I don't think they're really, I, I don't think anyone's really found one. Because, well, okay, I think the true right answer is, if you're going to review a game in early access, you have to stick with it every fucking step of the way. Otherwise, don't do it because you are eventually over time that work is doing a disservice to the game, to your audience, to your credibility, and to the game developers. Uh, like no one is coming out on top there. No one is 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 winning because you've got a three year old review of an early access game that is still technically in early access. Like that doesn't help anyone. Um, and I think it's a, a big part of like why I think reviews are, are kind of broken. Um, you know, cause you can, <laughs> yeah. Grant Harrier asks, why can't you just have an early access review? Are we just assuming people are so stupid to realize it's not a review of the old product? So I will tell you as someone who has fielded these sort of emails in the past, um, Yes, people, you can write whatever you want on that page. People will not fucking read it. You could have a big red stop sign fucking, hey, this review is two years old of an early access product. All people are seeing is on some other website, oh, IGN gave this game a seven. Or all, fuck those guys, you know, like, oh, they're, they're, they're just seeing the text in the bottom. They're only reading the bottom review. Like, people just don't fucking read shit. <laughs> It's just, that ship is sailed, man. That, that's like, that fight was lost decades ago. That fight was lost, man. There was, I, we would see the numbers because at some point we, we, you know, we had multi-page text reviews. We could write as many pages as we want. And I wrote a lot of fucking words about video games for a very long time. Um, and you would see the numbers, the click-through rates on like, here's, okay, this review was in the top slot. Page one did a million fucking page views yesterday, which happened. That used to fucking happen. <laughs> page two, 300,000. You know, uh, the drop-off, like people would just load it up, look at the score and move on. 
Maybe they, maybe if you're lucky, they would read the introductory paragraph. But I bet if they were skipping ahead to page two, it's because they wanted to read the concluding paragraph and none of it. And none, none of the rest of it. In a lot of cases. So yeah, no, it's, there are a lot of people that are not there to read a full review. So, so I was like, you know, I, I eventually subscribed to the theory of, which I think is, is the right move. I, you're trying to make your service, your website, your reviews, whatever it is, as useful to the audience as possible. And so for the, for me, that became, we're putting the score at the top of the review and we're going to include some bullet points, whether they're pros and cons, or I, I, we, we came up with an, I, I came up with an achievement icon system that was like great graphics or shitty frame rate or, you know, or whatever. And they had cool graphics, cool little icons. And if that was something that could sit at the top of a, of a review. So if people just didn't want, didn't fucking care about the review, they could at least leave with a block of information that was more than just a number. Um, so I, I don't know. I, I think it's, it's hard, especially right now when we're facing a, you know, a, a real time in this space where um, the idea of like professional games criticism like barely exists anymore. And, and you know, it's just kind of um, a lot of it is being decimated by this, the same way the rest of the media industry is being, you know, kind of torn apart here over ad sales and, and whatever else, you know, podcast ad market is down. There's, there's a lot of stuff across the board that is just like, you know, I, I think that like I've, I, as I've been saying, I think we are not done seeing layoffs in the, uh, game journalism market. I think that there's, there's plenty more shoes to drop around this business of, of what's left. Um, but already I think even the biggest websites, even IGN, which I think probably if I had to guess probably has the biggest staff of any of them, they do not have a staff size to actually review and update early access reviews. Um, unless they dropped a lot of other stuff that they, that does well for them, that, 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 that users are telling them that they want to see more of, you know? Um, and so I, I think that it's a, you know, the, the IGN video everyone's talking about and, and all that I, I think is, you know, it makes some unfortunate points that I, I think are not in line with, uh, the reality of Baldur's Gate's release. And I think, and I think like using Baldur's Gate as like, again, as this like weird cudgel here, is unfortunate because it, it's dragging this game into this conversation that it has, it doesn't need to be in. It doesn't need to be saddled with this horse shit. Baldur's Gate three is just a fantastic game that people are loving. It does not need to be like, why can't all games be like this? Because I think there are some very good reasons why Baldur's Gate three is an outlier when it comes to it is Baldur's Gate fucking three. It is a licensed Dungeons and Dragons game. It is a game that was in development for over five years. You know, like, like the, when you start looking at the, all of the stuff that Baldur's Gate kind of had going for it, you know, they were able to take all of that and turn out something incredible. Is it perfect? No. I mean, it sounds like that they're still, still working on fixes. It sounds like they still got some bugs to fix and whatever else. Cause that's video games, unfortunately. Um, but I, I think that, uh, the idea that this is something that like, Oh, every, every game should just be like this or everything is, uh, really out of touch with reality and really out of touch with kind of how, um, how most games are made. Could you make them all differently? <laughs> Not really. <laughs> um, yeah, you, you sure you could, but I think that uh, you end up in a situation where there are just a lot of types of games that are not going to have some of those headwinds and, and everything else. So, um, Can Shad asks, so was Baldur's Gate 3 an accident or a happenstance of circumstances that worked out in their favor? I mean, they paved their way for their own success, I think. But, you know, it is, again, I, you know, I think a lot of people seem to forget just how fucking big Baldur's Gate 2 was back in its day and how Larian has built up its reputation on some of these other games and it allowed them to get in a position where they could make Baldur's Gate 3. 
and that they spent a very long time in early access with buggy, you know, with, with, you know, not the game that's there today. Again, I, I think the, the conversation at that point becomes if you really want games to be like that, then what you're probably saying, what, what you're, what you're really saying, and you probably don't actually want this is you want to pay for games three years before they come out. You know, is that you're happy to subsidize and, and for some genres and some games, you should, I mean, a, a, a computer RPG, a CRPG like this, I think perfectly fits into everything we talked about when it comes to whether it's crowdfunding or early access or these alternate styles of release. I think that genre makes a ton of sense because that's a genre that doesn't, you don't see a lot of that. And so there are fans that are always saying, man, they should make more games like this. And then Larian said, Hey. Put your money where your mouth is. Let's go. And people showed up and made it happen. And people provided them with funding along the way that, you know, basically allowed them the time to get that game where it needed to be. And it worked out great for them. I don't think that that's a path that works out great for every franchise. I don't think it works out for something brand new that is unlicensed. Like, you know, if someone comes to you with a new IP and they don't have a pedigree and they're like, hey, give us, you know, you know, you end up in that weird Kickstarter lottery thing of just like you're looking at something going, this looks kind of rad, and then you buy it and maybe it never comes out or it comes out and it's dog shit and three years later. Like, are you saying, if are you really saying that you want to give developers your money before there's a game for you to play? Because I think that's where that heads if you're, if you're really saying make more things the way Baldur's Gate 3 happened. And I don't think that the public is willing to do that. I think some of the... Um... Across, you know, in, in massive quantities across all genres, right? I think you'll you'll find that there will be some, again, some genres that have kind of fallen by the wayside where you can go like, hey, we're really passionate about this and we want to make one of these. Like Double Fine did. And look at how it went for fucking Double Fine. There's a whole documentary about how fucking crazy that is. Um, and traditional pre-orders don't even really work that way because that money sits with GameStop. You know, until there's a game, you know, it's not, it's not like when you start a traditional pre-order campaign, you're suddenly flush with cash. All you know is you can budget against, well, we have this many pre-orders, so we think we can spend this amount of money. If everyone refunded their pre-order the day before release, you'd be like, oh, <laughs> um, so yeah, I, I don't know. I, I think that it's, uh, it, it doesn't, you know, the, the conversation around Baldur's Gate deserves to be around the quality of that game and how much people are loving it and how it is clearly a game of the year contender. I do not think that the quality of that game and these, the circumstances around the release of that game are such that you can try to put it on this pedestal and say, this is how all games should be made. That's just not reality. Um, so yeah, I, I don't know. I, I, this was something I didn't even think I was going to fucking talk about. Cause I was just like, man, fuck this shit. What a fucking dumb, what a dumb fight. And then over the weekend, it kind of kicked up again. I was like, God damn it. All right. All right. God damn it. <laughs> um, so it's just, yeah, it, it's not about like, oh, well, why don't the devs make them good for a change? Is it like a really like, d yeah, I don't know. It's very dumb. Baldur's Gate 3 seems like it is an exquisite, outstanding video game, well-written, amazing, memorable characters, um, and it seems like a wonderful Dungeons & Dragons game. It is, again, yeah, still in need of some fixes. Some people are saying like, oh, geez, yeah, Act 3's got some problems for sure. Um, and yeah, I'm sure they're, they're, still, they're still working on it. They've still got some fixes to go. And uh, they'll probably get there. But yeah, I don't know. It, it just... It's cool that that game came out. And um, it's cool that that game can exist at all. Because that's a genre of game that, again, has fallen by the wayside and been largely forgotten to the dusts of time. And I'll be curious. You know, I, I don't think... I don't necessarily think uh, we'll see a ton of games like this in its wake again because i think of you know like the what the ip the multiple ips 
kind of working in concert there. The, the, you know, like they'll eventually make something, you know, they, they were in the news last week saying like, I think our next game is going to be a little smaller. <laughs> like, yeah. Get this one done and then take a fucking break. You probably earned it. But, um, yeah, it, it's, it's complicated because I think, you know, you, you had developers kind of coming forward and, you know, I, I saw a few kind of saying, you know, that, oh, that, you know, what IGN is doing is hurting game developers and, and I see where they're coming from. It's just the sort of thing where I think you kind of have to remember, um, at the end of the day, and IGN's a big organization with a lot of different people in it, right? So, you know, uh, at the at the end of the day, um, people on the game journalism side of things are not really there to serve the game industry. For as much as there is an audience out there that seems to think that the the the, 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 the they, people in the game journalism business are in the pocket of big video games or fucking whatever stupid conspiracy bullshit they fucking cooked up that week. Um, at the end of the day, uh, that's, that's not why they're there. That said, I do believe that when you are putting out content, you should try to, you know, if you were going to make these kind of grand sweeping statements about how you think game development should work, you should know things about game development. I don't, I, I know very little about game development. I've been doing this for 30 years as a reviewer up until 2007 running reviews. I was deliberately kept out of conversations with a lot of game developers to deliberately not know about that stuff. Because when you're reviewing a game, the, you know, Hey, this developer had a hard time doing this. Shouldn't fucking matter. It's, is this worth the amount of money we are exchanging for it? Yes or no. Now, you know, obviously on the other side of, of starting things, I think that there's, you know, the, the, a lot of those conversations change. I think a lot of reviews just don't matter the way they used to. I think, you know, we have enough demos and betas and, and, and different scenarios where people can get their hands on games ahead of time and see builds ahead of time and, and whatever else that like the very idea of, um, is this review, is this game worth the money or not? Yes or no is not as valuable as it used to be. Um, and so, you know, over time I have, you know, become friends with people who make games. Um, and that was something I, I did not allow myself that consideration. I did not allow myself that for a very long time. I've tried very clearly to be like, I'm over here. You are over there. I will have a drink with you in an event and say, Hey, how's it going? And that is it, man. Um, that's not really the case anymore. You know, I, I, I know, a, people I worked with for years went into game development and that at the time was a really, a real mind fuck for me because of my hard line internal fucking status on this. Like, no, fuck them. No, fuck them. No, God damn it. Um, the reality is it's messy. People are messy, you know? And so you can only really do your best. Uh, and the other part of it is the audience will accuse you of being in the pocket of everyone anyway. So what the fuck does it matter? Like living your life for those fucking fuck ups. It's pointless. Um, so I have friends who make video games. Uh, and I've, you know, and, and I've, I've had conversations with people, you know, it's, it's nice to be able to occasionally talk to those folks, especially in situations like that. I have not really talked to anyone about this too much, but to be able to kind of, you know, like, Hey, it's really weird that this thing happened. Um, what do you think about that? And be able to have someone who has like decades of experience making games being like, well, you know, I don't know how they do it, but I think it could have been this, 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 or this. And, and they can come at it from a completely different perspective than I can because that, you know, they've, they've experienced the heartbreak of making video games. <laughs> um, and, uh, and I think that stuff is really interesting. And so what I'm doing here and what I've been doing for the last 10 or 15 years now, kind of on the other side of the, all that time as a reviewer is that kind of smaller audience, smaller conversation with people who actually do want to know about how games are made for people for whom those considerations are actually interesting and actually matter and are germane to the overall conversation. I think at the big level, 
If you're IGN, the most it, it is it is the most mainstream game review resource that's left, for for better or worse, it's it's the one. Then I think you're still in that like we're trying to serve this mainstream audience, and that mainstream audience doesn't give a fuck about who made this or did this or like oh man we wanted to do this and we heard this was bad you know. It's just not the conversation they're interested in having. They're like, yo, man, can I fucking get Madden? When can I get the Madden? You know, whatever. That... So it's it's a different thing, you know? And, and so, like, I, you know, around 08, decided that, it, you know, it, it's, it's finally time to start trying to talk to game developers and start trying to have, like, more meaningful conversations with them about how games are made and why and these things happen and how this stuff occurs. And we were able to have a lot of really great frank and open conversations with stuff. And then, you know, the, the internet became nasty. Uh, it's almost like in, in the face of that information, social media became fucking nasty and gross and basically yelled at those people until they said, Oh, well, I'm never going to go do an interview ever again because I'm not putting myself out there. I don't need this shit. And so the internet fucked up a really good thing. Um, and it's a bummer. <laughs> um, because you have a lot of people that are just like not interested in, in being the face of being, being out there as much as they used to. It was something that, you know, people were, were much more open to discussing their craft in a public setting and, and try to have these nuanced conversations and, and try to actually talk about how it really is. But, a lot of that nuance just gets fucking thrown out and someone then just goes make goes and makes some video about like, can you believe this thing they said? Taking something they said completely out of context and being like, they're lazy game developer and, you know, inciting a fucking online riot that didn't need to fucking be there. So, I, you know, again, I, you know, Baldur's Gate 3 by most accounts from the people who are playing a lot of it seem like they fucking love it. And I think that's great. I think it's fucking incredible that that game has come out and has been as well received as it has been. You know, the divinity games, obviously people were into those. This feels like a whole nother level. It's going to be very interesting to see what happens when that game hits consoles. Um, and it's going to be very interesting to see, you know, as that game kind of reaches uh, larger conversations, as more and more people hear about it and go, well, I should try this out. Are they going to get it and go, what the fuck is this? You know, are, are they going to be into it or is it going to be too much for them? I, I think that'll be an interesting hurdle or something that, um, that, 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 that game will end up hitting in, in some weird way. Cause I, you know, I, I think it's, Again, I think it's awesome for millions of people, but it's the sort of thing that I think you will have a situation where like, hey, you know, you'll, you'll, you'll eventually get people that are just like, what the fuck did I buy? <laughs> uh, and it's just not their kind of game. And I think that's a thousand percent fine. That's the good part about how big video games are now. You know, is that even the games that we look at as like these big game of the year contenders are not always going to be for everyone. And I think that's fucking great. That speaks to just how large the audience for video games has become and how many different styles and types of games that those people can be into or not into and everything, you know? It, this changed for, as far as I can tell, this changed in the 32-bit era. This changed around the release of the PlayStation. That's when it happened to me. Um, but... And I and I, I really feel like that's when a lot of game coverage started to change as well in the in the wake of that. But it was that feeling of like in the 16-bit era on the Genesis, on the SNES, you could play pretty much anything. And you pretty much did. It's been as I've been thinking about this process of going back and playing every 8-bit Nintendo game, I'm realizing just how many sports games there were. And also I'm realizing just how many sports games I, someone who was never particularly given a fuck about sports, with the exception of, you know, baseball, uh, how my, how many football games I played, whether it was Tecmo bowl or Joe Montana football or, uh, early Madden. I eventually learned the rules of hockey because I played so much of EA's hockey game because it's that good. I don't fucking give a fuck about hockey. I don't know a goddamn thing about fucking football, but, 
those early games, you could play them with anybody. And if you had friends who were sports fans, it was like, yeah, okay, yeah, you understand the sports part of this. I understand that, like, I need to fucking throw this ball to this guy. I need to hit this button at this time to make the ball go here so this guy catches it and then I can say fuck you and score. Like, I could I could approach it from a competitive video game standpoint and still have a pretty good time despite, like, not really giving a shit about football. Um... But as everything became more complicated, they started throwing more buttons on the controller and everything, you know, like everything kind of started splitting off into its own universes. Um, and so that was sports games, or I think were one of the first to do that where you had a situation and I've said this before, so I'll, I'll keep it brief and we'll move on. But, uh, where you had specific people at publications who had been hired to review sports games, because those were the first ones to kind of feel like they were specialized in a way where you're like, ah, eh, we probably need someone who actually gives a fuck about the sport to review Madden now. And, and because they're the only ones who are going to be able to tell you what's different from the college football game to the pro football game. I don't, I know there's some rule differences between the two things. I don't know what the fuck it is. Like you can run, you, you know, I know what it, you can run towards the line of scrimmage in college football, right? Or is that just arena football? I don't even, whatever, what fucking whatever point being you eventually needed people for that. And then role-playing games on console, especially, but you know, certainly, uh, and, and I feel like the PC resisted this for a good long time, but on console role-playing games were the next to kind of spin off, like in the post final fantasy seven world where it's like, that's a fucking 40 hour game. I think a lot of us were just like, I'm not fucking doing that. Like, I don't want to play those games anymore. I just don't care. Like I liked these games a generation ago and now I am done with them. And so you had people that we had on staff that were just like, you're the, you're the role-playing game person. Kadelka just came in. Is, is that an R? I think it is here. You go review Kadelka. Um, it's a strategy. Whatever. RPG. It's the same thing. Go take it over here. Leave me alone. Um, and now I think, you know, we're at a point where everything has become a little bit specialized driving games became simulation racing games. And suddenly, you know, in a post Gran Turismo era, you wanted people that knew more about cars and racing than, than I did. Um, and so like, I, you know, I never Gran Turismo was always too simulation ish for me. I was just like, this is not fun at all. Take these license tests and get fucked. So, ironically, same reason I didn't like driver, <laughs> the license tests. Um, but yeah, you know, so I, as that stuff diversified and specialized, you know, you ended up with these genres that, you know, could only be covered by certain people and you needed to have people on staff or freelancers on staff that could specialize in those sorts of things. And so I had a number of freelancers that were good people to cover um, role-playing games and some of them um, knew enough Japanese so they could review the imports and that was always awesome. Um... And, you know, things kind of just split apart on those lines. And now, yeah, you know, now because of the skill ceilings in first person shooters and all, you know, you could make the argument that like, you know, that every genre has split apart in that weird way. Um, fighting games became less of a generalist thing and more of a highly specif specific thing. First person shooters got all esports up. And, uh, you know, the, the high skill ceiling there became something that people wanted to know about. But at the end of the day, the other thing is most of the people in the audience are never going to be that good. And so it's this weird feeling of like, you have people who think you should be covering games from this absolute 100,000 like esports level skill perspective. And, and that's not what the job is for the mainstream game journalist for the, anyone at a publication that is not pure esports focused or, or anything like that. They're not writing to you. Like the people who are like laughing at like, I can't believe I, I saw that guy play and he was, or, you know, like somebody happened when I played fucking Baldur's gate of all things. Like I played on easy. Cause I was like, fuck it. I'm, I just want to see as much of this game as I can. 
And people are like, oh, it's game journalist mode. I was like, get fucked. Like, that's the, you're the dumbest motherfucker alive. Um, because it's not about that, especially from a review perspective. You know, the, the job of a game journalist is to, you know, is to appeal to the people that are in your audience. And without fail, the audience that I have always found myself with are, you know, somewhat skilled, relatively skilled, but not esports good. They're not looking for like, what's my next esports game? Because that's dictated by a schedule and prize pools and whatever else. That's not dictated by fucking reviews. Um, and so it was always weird when you'd have people go like, these guys are no good at the game. And I'd be like, yeah, that's fine. We're good enough. We're better than most. Uh, we're we're going to be better than the... I, 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 can, I feel like I can say with some confidence, I am uh, better than the average video game player. It's not to say I'm great at all video games, but I the, the skill a reviewer needs is to be able to pick that shit up quickly. <laughs> um... And, uh, and be able to play a game to completion quickly. Uh, usually on its default settings, that was how I typically operated, you know, um, because I always just operate on the assumption that most people are just going to slam the X button until the video game starts. They're not going to sit there and read all the nuanced difficulty settings and, and whatever else. Right. So, um, but yeah, I don't know. This would all this always surfaces in a, in a variety of ways. Where, oh God, we had Ryan McDonald had won a big tall trophy playing Tekken, like Tekken three or something, at some Namco run tournament. Um, the you know at, at some press event or something. They had you know they had people play Tekken. Ryan was quite good at Tekken. He won the tournament uh, and came home with the trophy. And so we put the trophy on our live show on, uh, on the spot. And, uh, you know, it's like a cheap, it's a piece of shit trophy. <laughs> it's like a shitty bowling trophy, you know, but it was, it was big. It was tall. Um, and I think Rich refer and, and Rich still refers to it. It's just like, he's the, yeah, the world champion Tekken three player, Ryan McDonald. Here he is tournament winner. Uh, Best in the world. Best Tekken player in the world. And people were so fucking pissed. Because there was just a bunch of people that were just like, well, who the fuck is this? Guy? I've never heard of him. I, I've never, I'm in the Tekken scene, which of, of what there was then, right? You know, this is a long time ago. Tekken 3, you know, that's a, well, probably this would have been PlayStation 2 days and thinking about the office we were in and, and whatever else. So this, this would have had to have been Probably Tekken Tag. No, Tekken Tag was too early too. This would have had to have probably been Tekken 4 or 5, I'm guessing. Because if Rich was involved, Rich was not there in the PlayStation 1 days. Anyway. But like, it was not, you know, the streaming days of fucking the FGC is this and that. You know, it's like, it was just like... And people were so fucking pissed. The other Fighting games were the worst. Fighting Covering fighting games pre-release was always the fucking the worst dipshits would come fucking find you. Cause you would get a build of the game and they'd be like, you can put up videos of you playing and like word. All right. We'd play. And like, again, I, you know, playing fighting games. I feel like I'm all right at them. Am I the best in the world? No. Can I pick them up relatively quickly and, and get to like a low to medium level of skill? Yeah, sure. Maybe. But like every single video you put up, was dom or every live stream we're like hey we got a build of tekken in here we're gonna um or we got to build a soul Calibur 2 we're gonna be playing it on the live show today and you would see people go like i can't believe that namco would give a build of this game to these fucking pieces of shit and not me because i'm good at this game they're just like you, you congratulations so whenever anyone says anything about like difficulty settings and oh game journalists play on easy i just think about those fuckers like you're the same level of dipshit as that guy, basically, <laughs> you know, it was just like, oh yeah, that's clearly, yes, yes. If they had sent the build of the game to you, then what? You would have played it and said it was good. You were buying it anyway, you stupid motherfucker. Um, 
yeah so i, I don't know that that's it's just fucking crazy um what about the Cuphead tutorial guy? Yeah, I mean, that's a guy that primarily does business reporting that was put in a situation where he was able to record footage of a game. And so he recorded it rather than not recorded it. But um, that guy primarily reports on business and does not review games. Should they have done something else with that footage? Maybe, I don't know. Yeah, maybe they shouldn't have put it up. I don't know. But they had the footage, so they put it up. Um, But... Yeah, I don't know that that website is not there for you. That, that there, that's not the line of work they're in. Is like we've got exclusive first footage of Cuphead. So you know, maybe they, maybe that's not their lane. Uh, and and maybe they should have made a a different call there. But, uh, but yeah, that's you want to try to put the right person in front of the good game to make sure that you're getting good footage and all that other stuff. And sometimes that's not a perfect science. Um. And, you know, sometimes shit like that happens. It's, it's, but like that guy was not, he is not a re reviewer. He is not a, you know, he, Dean walks, when you see Dean at an event, Dean is really, I, I think like Dean does his business thing, but he, Dean walks around with a laptop out, holding it in one hand and typing on the other as he is like walking around asking people questions. <laughs> it's really a sight to see. Uh, and he's done that for as long as <laughs> I have known him. I've seen, I've not seen him at an event in a while. So maybe he's changed it out for a tablet or something else by now. But, but when I think of Dean, I think of him walking around with a laptop out, just asking questions. I think, well, what about, uh, can we do this? And, is, and can you, uh, how many weapons or, you know, like, like those sorts of things. Um, but yeah, you know, that the, the cuphead thing, Probably just a bad judgment call. I don't know. You end up, you know, that's, that's like, uh, you know, when I, this contributed to in the weird back in the day thing, I, we got to move on to news here, but, um, when I reviewed Kane and Lynch, a video game for the Xbox 360, um, I was busy that day and did not record the footage myself. And so someone else recorded the footage who had not played the game. We were in the middle of transitioning over to a new model where we were going to have people who were in a position to record the footage. And so we were not going to do it. Uh, the reviewer was not going to do it themselves. So it was a, a situation where we would like hand it off and be like, I right, go, you go ahead and do it. I didn't have footage for the game for the video review. And so the person got a hold of it and they recorded the footage and all of it came from the first level and it was all them playing it for the very first time. And so the, the, it was not like I would have played the game better than that person but boy, oh boy, did I not have time or desire to play that game that day. And so on top of all the other fucking stupid shit that happened with that, there were some people that like looked at the video reviews like, oh, the footage from the first level. He didn't even play it. I was like, get fucked. Shit happens. Sometimes people are fucking busy and other people record footage for games. It's not ideal. It's just fucking real life. Um, anyway. Baldur's Gate. It'll be interesting to see how well it does at the end of the year when it comes to kind of awards time because people seem incredibly excited about it. And, you know, I mean, congratulations to Larian for like sticking the landing as much as it seems like they did. I mean, I know they're still working on it and, and patching it up, but like it seems like a scenario that could have gone fucking way worse <laughs> than it did quality wise, right? Um, But yeah, um, let's see. Videogameschronicle.com is reporting that THQ is going to make a new South Park game. Can you think of two brands that go together in a 25 years old kind of way more than THQ and South Park? Uh, it is called Snow Day, and uh, I guess it got announced during a live stream. It's being described as a 3D co-op adventure. It'll be out next year on PC, PlayStation 5, Xbox Series XS, and Switch. Um, yeah, they've got a bit of the synopsis here. Yeah, say it's a polygonal in, in three-dimensional glory to celebrate those most magical day in any young child's life, a snow day. Grab up to three friends and battle your way through the snow-piled streets of South Park 
on a quest to save the world and enjoy a day without school. It's coming from Question Games, which is the studio that did the Magic Circle, which is crazy. <laughs> uh, that's the part where you're like, oh, what? Wait, what? The fuck? <laughs> um, they're going to make a South Park game? All right. Cool. Uh, and it sounds like uh, as Oliver uh, Nelson, Nelson Jr., uh, who was in the news with some of this Baldur's Gate stuff is, is, uh, doing some work on this game as well. Um, and, uh, yeah, there's a trailer out there. If you want to see it, I don't South park, man. I, you know, I it's, uh, as much as I was talking about THQ and South park being a, a, a duo here, it's really like, I, is South park, like the M M&M of, uh, com- a comedy t- of, of cartoon television shows is that maybe like a better analogy to make where you're like oh they're still ma- are still doing this huh still making these wow all right great that's for someone um someone someone is excited about this i suppose um but yeah i don't, I don't know man it's uh good on them <laughs> I, I guess, I, I, well, whatever. I, I think it's like the the developer, the choice of developer here, qu- having question games d- do it, I, I think is really interesting because they have made some really fascinating stuff. They made the Magic Circle again, which, you know, if you remember that game um, where you're kind of like playing a game and then breaking out of it as you're playing it and and all of this other stuff, it was a, that was a, there were some neat ideas in that game. So be curious to see what that developer brings to bear on a South Park co-op game. Weird, right? Um, but yeah, we'll, we'll see. We'll see all these South park games and not enough orgasmo games. I I just, you know, again, I I just, can we get one orgasmo video game? That's all I want. That is, that is their best work. As far as I'm concerned, the movie orgasmo, uh, I think is is funnier and uh, better written than. But, well, yeah, you could make a basketball game, It'd be like a, a VR game or something. I don't know. Um, a VR basketball game. That's my pitch. I want fourteen. No, I want forty million dollars to make my VR basketball game. Um. In other news, Rockstar has acquired CFX.re, um, which is a great uh, URL. They are, but th- that is the team that is responsible for 5M, which is the the popular role playing mod for Grand Theft Auto V Online, um, as well as I guess they do a version for Red Dead. Um, but they are the ones that are doing all those dedicated role play servers and, and all of that crazy shit. Um, Rockstar has apparently decided to buy the company responsible for making that stuff instead of suing them out of existence, which they tried to do a while ago. <laughs> um, or at least like, like we're, we're really attempting to shut them down. Um, this is. Yeah, so they've got some quotes here. Uh, again, uh, Video Games Chronicle has picked up this article. VideoGamesChronicle.com. That is uh, continuing to be my first stop for video game news uh, here for the for here for the show. Um, but uh, yeah, Five M has been the the kind of long running popular role playing mod for GTA Five. Um, and that stuff's been massive at times in the past. And as they get closer and closer to making GTA six, like this is okay. Think about it this way. Um, think about that. This is the value of what they're doing with, with five M and, and what, what the value of GTA role play is to them right now today. Uh, I'd be really curious to know what percentage of people that are playing GTA five are, um, are playing 5M or, or, or consuming 5M in, in some way or another. Now, some of the streams, but I, but I also feel like a dominating percentage of the conversation around G- GTA 5 streaming, GTA 5 creators, 
and so on and so forth. All of that is clips of people on roleplay servers. You know, that's, that's TikToks of people pretending to be cops on roleplay servers. It's huge. That stuff is still huge. Um, and so when you go and and so here's the quote that they they have in there as as a way to further support these efforts we recently expanded our policy on mods to officially include those made by the roleplay creative community by partnering with the CFX RE team we will help them find new ways to support this incredible community and improve the services they provide to their developers and players um yeah it's funny you know cuz rockstar has traditionally sued modders <laughs> and, and and all of that stuff and try to say this is our ip this is that um so i i think this you know i i think the the big conversation around gta 6 uh that is starting to take shape is what is what is the online portion of it going to be what are they going to do and, I, and that it, it kills me a little bit as someone who has not really been into the online side of gta at all but also, like, I'm not dumb. Like, you think about the amount of money GTA Online has made, and you think about, you know, how many of those players are involved in some of this, you know, or, or interested or adjacent to some of this role-playing stuff. I think bringing these role-play people in-house and saying, you build it for us now, and now we can find ways to make money on that and better monetize our role-play role play stuff and blah, 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 um, is probably one of the smartest things they could have done in terms of expanding what the offering for GTA 6 will eventually be. Because they'll have their single player story crime thing and then people will play that for a couple of days and then immediately forget that it ever existed because they will be way more invested in the online side of it and way more invested in whatever this role play side of it ends up being. Um, this is probably, again, I think this is a, a massive, this, this is a really smart thing for Rockstar to do again, because I, I think the, when you, we look at social media, when you look at TikTok, when you look at like kind of the, the footage of GTA five that makes it way out into the mainstream, like I said, I think the overwhelming majority of it is people doing role play. Uh, you have some cases where people are doing like VR mods and first person, like you, you know, you'll see people that are playing GTA five in VR and, you know, shooting out of their window and doing all that sort of stuff. Like the, the modding aspect of GTA and some of the things that have, that have come out of that are the things that have helped keep that game alive for as long as it has been alive. Because that's the stuff that is the calling card for people who are not playing it. They see shit like that and they're like, oh man, you can be a cop. You can go do this. And oh man, I'm going to try and get in here and do this. And, and you know, maybe they're into the role play aspect and maybe they're not. I don't know that I, I, I feel like if you would have told me about this a long time ago, that uh, there was a point in my life where that I would have been all about this, this role play voice chat, uh, type of shit. But I, I just, I don't know that I have an interest in it at all anymore. I don't know that that I don't know that that interest is is there with me anymore. Um, and uh, yeah, of course, yeah, we, we, yeah. Some of this stuff happens in Arma as well. All, all this life and whatever else, uh, you know, that kind of happens on there. But like the, you don't see nearly as much Arma footage out there anymore uh, when it comes to like look at this wacky role play shit. It is almost all GTA. And none of it is fucking Red Dead, honestly. Like I, I, I did not know that they did a for like a Red Dead version of their role play stuff. I cannot imagine that that is doing all that well. That is not a thing that anyone is. Yeah, that that's like the Red Dead online stuff. It felt like they fucking buried that behind the saloon out back like th four years ago or something. I was like, oh yeah, well, this is not going to be as big as GTA. We should probably get back to making new cars for GTA online. Fuck this. Um, so yeah, I, I don't know. I, I think that this is a super smart thing for them to do. If, if only for like what it means for the future tool sets in GTA six and, and what people will be able to do. If those people have more direct access, if, if the five M people have more direct access to the game, uh, at a lower level than they do today, I think that that's fantastic. Um, for, for those role play people for whatever else. Also, again, I, I bet that this becomes a way that Rockstar finds ways to better monetize the role playing aspect of the game. 
uh, than they did before. So, you know, let's not, let's not be crazy here. Let's, this is, this is, it. but additionally, and this is something that maybe makes money in a more indirect way. That calling card for GTA online is TikTok videos of, of people role-playing. It's people on social media role-playing and posting the footage of them doing it and streaming it and all this other stuff and people watching it and going like, that looks incredible. And then maybe getting into the game. So I, I think that that's, that's smart too. Um, but yeah, what, what will happen? Yes, that it's an, yeah. Ben, the bus boy says, I generally think this acquisition is likely bad for long-term RP communities potentially. Um, because I don't think that this means, you know, they are saying, uh, Hey, we've recently expanded our policy on mods to officially include those made by the role play creative community. Sounds good. But once they've got official role play tools in place, other people making unofficial role play tools might find a much colder shoulder waiting for them. That's certainly possible. Um, but now that they're going to build their own thing, they're like, no, you can't build your own thing. This is, you are circumventing our monetization strategy. We are shutting you down. If you want to play role play, we've got it right here. So yeah, there, there's certainly always the potential for that shit to be a net negative. Um, but we'll see. I, 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 what I will say is I think it's incredibly smart for rockstar to do this. It is savvy of them to recognize that this is something they need to bring in house and make part of their money making machine. So so yeah, uh, as you know, as you likely know, Lance Reddick, uh, passed away recently earlier this year, tragically. Um, and that fucking sucks. He's an incredibly talented, uh, actor in the video game world. Uh, that has led to, I think there's a memorial to his character or to him inside of Horizon now. I believe they put something in there. I don't know what form that took, uh, but I but I saw that they were doing something. Um, and it also means that, you know, because he is actively voicing a character in Destiny's ongoing story, um, that Bungie was going to have to address that uh, sooner rather than later. Uh, they have announced uh, that they have found a new voice for... Zavala, uh, who was Lance Reddick's uh, character, and uh, he will now be voiced by Keith David. Um, I, I, I love Keith David. I love Keith David. I think if you're going to, um, try to find someone to continue the voice of Zavala, which, you know, again, they're moving up to this big story here. Um, you know, they're, they're, they're reaching these big story beats where the, you know, Zavala needs to be there. Um, I, Keith David to me seems like a, a great choice. I think his voice is, I think his voice is, is very iconic in a, in the same, in a similar way to Lance Reddick's. I, I think that they are both very different. You're not going to confuse one for the other. Um, but I think that Keith David is, is a, is, is a, a fantastic voice. Um, you know, uh, as the like narrator or whatever for the West side connection albums, Keith David, Keith David has done some amazing work. Um, of course his work in the saints row games, I thought was, was really good. Um, and he will be taking on the role of Zavala. They are so in, in the statement that they put out, uh, they have a, a statement here from, from Mr. David says, I am honored to continue the great work of Lance Reddick as Zavala. Lance captured the character's sense of integrity. So wonderfully, it is my intention to continue that work. Um, so this is not like a situation when they took, uh, Peter Dinklage out of the game. What they are saying here is, so the, the, what, they, what they have said here is, Keith David, a prolific actor on the stage and in television, film, and games, will assume the English language voice of Zavala in the final shape and beyond. Separately, Lance's existing lines in-game will remain untouched for the upcoming release. Um, so it's not a situation where they're going to have Keith David come in and re-record every line in the game they are going to leave 
Lance Reddick's performance in the game. And then, uh, you know, new lines going forward will be done by, by Keith David. Um, I think that's appropriate as much as like, I think on paper you go like, well, that's, you know, is, that's a, that's a weird change midstream, blah, blah, blah. You know, I, I, I think that they, I think that's the right move. The other thing I would say is remain untouched for the upcoming release does not say in perpetuity. And so I do wonder if it is something that they would eventually change. Um, I don't know. I, I don't know what they will do it, but you know, this is the sort of thing that maybe they, maybe they end up changing direction for that character and for that character's arc or potentially, you know, there could, this could be a situation where Zavala was going to, you know, die in the line of duty as part of the final shape story. We don't, we don't really know. So, you know, they, they could be a case where like, Hey, we're bringing on Keith David for this last bit here. And we are going to write the character out of the story. Um, we, we don't know. Um, we'll, we'll kind of have to see how that goes, what they, what they eventually intend to do. Um, but I, I would expect that this ends up in a situation where they gin up a storyline reason to where you end up not having the Lance Reddick character in the game anymore. Um, and potentially Keith David is only there for a short haul to kind of, you know, fill in this kind of final gap here. Um, I feel like that would make sense to, to do that. Um, because they're headed for such a, you know, they are, they are on the road to such a, a big point in their story that like those sorts of, uh, you know, kind of plot line character deaths and stuff, I think, you know, that, it, it makes sense from a storyline perspective. They, they could make that make sense if that's what they wanted to do. Um, we'll, we'll see. It's a touchy subject, I'm sure, right? Because then it's like, oh, well, you killed the character. on like that, that might seem weird, too. Um, and in a world where characters come back, like Cade is coming back, I guess. Um, because of course he is. Because he, of course, you know, of course he was. Um, that, you know, there's other stuff. I don't know. Guardians, right? They come back from the dead all the time. Why not this time? Storyline reasons. Plot armor, blah, blah, blah. You know, there's plenty of, of things they could do there. Um, we'll see. Or, you know, hey, maybe they just they, they have another 10 years of destiny and Keith David is there as the voice of Zavala. We, we'll see. Steven Totillo over at Axios is reporting that the company that the Embracer Group had a $2 billion deal with that fell through was the Savvy Games Group. Um, you may not remember who Savvy Games is, but that is the, uh, that is the Saudi government. Um, that is their like PIF, whatever public fund that the, the Saudis, the Royal family use to try to make money on things other than oil. Um, and that's the, that's the fund that they have been using to invest in, companies from you know well they i mean they i think they own pretty much all of snk by now right but they're investing in nintendo and plenty of other companies around the world right um yes the the savvy games group i believe yeah they own what like scopely which is the mobile developer yeah they just go again according to axios they bought scopely for 4.9 billion uh scopely i believe is the company that makes that star trek game that sucks so much shit God damn. Um, and uh, yes, so um, Axios is reporting that that Savvy was the, the company that had $2 billion ready to give to Embracer Group and that that fell through uh, immediately beforehand. Axios learned of, this is from their story, Axios learned of Savvy's involvement from four sources familiar with the deal who were not authorized to speak about it publicly and after reviewing documentation related to the planned partnership. Um, 
and em Embracer uh, uh, declined to comment and Savvy has not commented by press time. So let's see here. They're saying that the $2 billion deal would have involved Savvy investing in the development and publishing of games from Embracer, helping establish the Saudi company as a major gaming label. Um, and, you know, if you remember, this had reached like a verbal commitment stage. And then, uh, and then that stuff kind of went south, I suppose. Um, Yes, so the, 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 the public investment fund, which is Saudi Arabia's sovereign wealth fund um, that Savvy was also started out of, that is the fund that they have used to invest in Take-Two, Nintendo, Electronic Arts, and a lot of other, uh, a, a, lot of, a lot of other publishers. There is quite a lot of Saudi money here. Uh, apparently they, yes, 7.1% of Nintendo is owned by the Saudi government. Um... $265 million went into uh, Vespo, which is a Chinese esports company. So yeah, they, they've, they've got gaming investments uh, across the board. Um, and that fell apart on Embracer, and that's why Embracer had to scramble and, and do all that stuff, and now Embracer is uh, in, in bad shape because the Saudis pulled out of the deal for, for unknown reasons. Um... Our last story uh, today is more, I guess, more of a program note. Next Tuesday is, uh, in, I believe, in the morning here. So I believe we will we will be covering it in this time slot here is uh, Gamescom opening night live, which is Keeley's stage show kicking off the beginning of Gamescom. I have gotten a handful of invites to see some games at Gamescom like I do every year and uh it seems like it is happening on a, you know, a, a regular schedule. And it seems like it's going to be your typical kind of Gamescom, I'll say. Uh, what Keeley said to, uh, to Video Games Chronicle is that the focus of his opening night live show will be a little less on announcing new games and more on um, updates for existing games. They have said that uh, Alan Wake 2 and Black Myth Wukong will be part of the show. I assume we will also get like two hours of farming simulators from Hamizbant. That's not how you pronounce that at all, but I don't remember. But we will let's uh, let's watch that and talk over it on Tuesday. Yeah, maybe Stalker Two will show up. All right. Um, but uh, yeah, it will probably. I don't know. Do we see another Mortal Kombat character reveal there? Because that's you know three weeks before that game's out or something. So maybe there's more to do there or, or whatever. But, but primarily. A lot of the focus at these stage shows are games that are being developed in Europe and um, all of, you know, all of that sort of stuff. Yeah, maybe we could see kind of one last look at Armored Core. That would be an interesting thing. This this could be our last chance to see Elden Ring DLC. Is that, is that supposed to still come out this year? Because they're running out of time to talk about it, I guess. But yeah, I don't know. Yeah, all, all your favorite PAL games. Probotector. <laughs> um, Elden Ring stuff is next year. Okay, so maybe that shows up at the Game Awards or something like that. Then, if if that's not actually out this year, then then who knows? Um, but yeah, I believe that's going to happen. Let's let's let me look this up real quick because uh, I forgot to look it up and write it down before the show. Um. The number of big named websites who have, and, and I guess, hey, this is exactly what I'm looking for. So I guess this is my fault. How to watch Jeff Keighley's showcase. Everything you need to know, date, time, et cetera. You know, like the number of like SEO'd out the ass headlines. Uh, that'll be 11 a.m. Pacific time. So that'll be basically about an hour ago, but next week. So middle of the show. So I don't know. I don't know. We'll, we'll do an hour of podcast. And then we'll uh, we'll talk uh, we'll talk over the Gamescom stuff after that, and then maybe we'll wrap up the podcast after that if there's more to say. But uh, news has been kind of slow anyway, so maybe we could have a, a shorty of a podcast to do the the talk over of uh, of Keeley's show next week right here on this station. Um. 
And that's it for the news. You know, we, we've we've definitely hit the, we're still in that weird kind of summer time frame where, uh, well, and, and of course, you know, next week is going to be the Gamescom thing. So there'll be people saving announcements for that. And though it sounds like not a ton of announcements, maybe more updates and, and, and what have you. Um, yeah, I don't know. It'll be cool to see more Alan Wake too. That game looked rad when I saw it back in June. Um, so it'll be kind of cool to see another chunk of that. Um, and we'll see what else ends up being there. You know, is it just an hour of, uh, foam stars? Can we get like a, can we get the foam stars hour? Oh, that'd be pretty good. Um, why don't we get into some emails here? Podcast at guard.bike is the email address for you to type into your email client to send emails to me that I can read here on this podcast. Um, let's see here. We got a few. Oh, geez. We'll take, we'll take this one. This one came in a few minutes ago. So I have not, uh, yeah, Dunkin' Donuts is putting out uh, iced coffee and teas with alcohol in it. I don't, it, this seems like a fucking bad idea. Um, two flavors of coffee, like a regular and a mocha, and then two iced teas. One is, I believe, lemon, and the other is like a berry refresher or something like that. It's like 5% and 6%. Like 5% on the coffee, 6 on the, the mocha. But remember, it's coffee flavored. I I am going to guess here. I, I have not seen for sure, but I am I am going to guess. Let's let's he provided a CNN article. Let's double check here. But I am going to go ahead and say that these malt-based beverages do not have caffeine in them. We'll see. Okay. Hmm. 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 That nah, might as well be zero. Uh, they have about 30 milligrams of caffeine in them, which CNN notes is less than the average 100 milligrams of caffeine found in a cup of coffee. So that's not zero, but that's not like four loco levels of fucking let's go. That is like, eh, there's a little bit in here, but it's a malt based thing. It's like you drank it. Yeah. It's like you drank a fucking diet coke or something or whatever it's um so who cares <laughs> um i this sounds disgusting to me a malt based coffee beverage like malt based alcoholic beverages generally are fucking terrible anyway all of the four locos and saint eyed special brews and all of this shit over the years that has come along um a lot of it has been terrible that's not to say that I have not drank a lot of them over the decades. Um, yeah, I like a nice malt liquor. You know, like, like don't you don't need to gussy it up. I'll just take a, a 40 of Ides. Or a Colt 45. Yeah, why not? Nice Schlitz. Ride the bull, baby. You know, something good. Steel Reserve, no, come on. You got to draw a line. Camo. I'm not drinking a Camo 40. Oh, Cam. Do they even still make Camo? Or have the people that made Camo been fucking thrown in jail where they belong? Because Jesus. Uh, yeah, a Cobra. Yeah, I'll drink a King Cobra. Oh, man. Yeah. Yes, King Cobra. Yes. Old English? Absolutely. Mickey's? Sure. What, you want, you want the fancy stuff? Oh, I guess. Um... But yeah, a lot of these malt beverages, Four loco and, and all that sort of stuff, um, the, the big draw was that a lot of it had caffeine in it eventually, you know, but well, the other draw was that a lot of it was super fruit flavored in ways that appealed to minors, <laughs> which is probably not awesome. Um, and so it's kind of weird that we're heading down this road even further um, of like, it's a coffee drink, but also it's 5% alcohol. Like eh, something about this seems questionable, but. I don't know. I think that just sounds like a bad idea. I don't think those sound like good drinks. Um, and if I was going to be drinking malt based beverages, I, I would love for them to have uh, illegal amounts of caffeine and energy drink stuff in them. Uh, the way God intended. 
the way the God, the, the God that invented sparks, the way that God intended the fuck for loco. I want the pre for loco energy stuff for loco was like the also ran that when it came along, you're like, Oh, I guess this company is also making this shit too. Oh wait, these numbers seem higher. Like that was the thing it had going for it. I was like, there's more booze in this. And you're like, ah, yes. Yeah. Uh, yes. Uh, Gosh goose says, I think white claw is technically a malt beverage. I believe you're right. And, um, white claw fucking sucks. It's terrible. All of that stuff is garbage. I, I don't like, I understand how that stuff took off because it like every generation has their own Zima, right? It would, there was Zima and then there was, you know, you got that nice Zemo gold, that fancy shit. Hmm. Remember the Captain Morgan's, uh, like r- pre-mixed rum and Cokes. I think it was called Captain Morgan's gold. I believe and that shit was disgusting. Uh, but like white claws and stuff, you know, it's like, whatever, like you, you know, you need fruit flavored drinks for minors to get fucked up on. Like that's, you know, the same way, like a, a Mike's hard lemonade or, you know, go back even further to some fucking straight up wine coolers, like Bartles and James type shit, man. Like that's nothing wrong with like a nice fruit flavored beverage. I don't like the fucking taste of alcohol either. So I, you know, I'll drink that shit too. But like all of that stuff always had this really nasty undertone to it where it was like you're making this for kids aren't you i mean you're not making it for kids but you're you know this is, this is gonna this is not gonna this is not a good this is not good what you're doing here yeah strawberry I, I, yes yeah, strawberry boone's farm let's fucking go yes club yes a nice club pre-mixed censored on the beach something nice Oh, <laughs> that's the type of drinking I like to do. Shitty kinds, the worst kinds, but whatever, I, don't, I don't even mad dog. 2020 is too much. Mad dog. 2020 is like they in Cisco. That's like, that stuff is over the line. That stuff is like, you could graduate into that at some point. If you're like, yeah, this is also fruit flavored. You just taste a lot less of the fruit flavoring and more of the paint thinner in this stuff. Oof. Ugh. Disturbing. Um, let's get into the rest of these emails. Sleazy G from the CLE writes in and says, I know you were a fan of TV Carnage and Smash TV, not, not the game. But neither have done anything new for a while. Do you have any suggestions for things past gifts that can stra- scratch that itch? I think TV Carnage, I think Derek Beckles was the best to do it. I like, uh, with, uh, it, with the possible exception of the last thing he put out, which was the workout DVD, the TV Carnage workout DVD, I thought was um, a great concept that I don't think was as fun to watch as the straight up regular TV carnage, uh, releases. Um, if you're not familiar, this is, uh, you know, this is, uh, people finding footage. It's like kind of found footage, hilarious, bad footage cut together into into sort of a video mixtape. Um, you know, Gary Coleman TV movies and, uh, you know, that movie with the fucking the Frisbee and the Molokai cops that, you know, a lot of the stuff that makes the, uh, the footage of, the pastor that morphs into a jet and flies off the screen that I think made its way around in clip form in uh, animated gif form as well that uh, originally surfaced in TV carnage and that originally surfaced by me recording it on my TiVo and sending it to TV carnage to go into that compilation. You're welcome. Um, and, uh, yeah, I don't know. Everything is terrible is on tour right now. Like they're l- literally, um, they're literally on tour with something right now. Um, I think one of their like kids compilations or something. I don't know what city they're in, uh, at the moment, but, but everything is terrible has been doing that for a long time. And, and they, they're putting on live shows. So you could go theoretically check that out if they're in your town. The everything is terrible stuff I find is a little, I, again, I, I, 
I'm, my favorite way to watch TV Carnage is with the commentary, because I think that Derek Beckles, Pinky, if you will, I think his commentary is really funny. I think his commentary is really fantastic on it. Uh, and so when I go back and watch those TV Carnage DVDs these days, I usually find myself turning his commentary on because it's just, it's funny. And he's in Canada. He was, he was based in Canada. So he has a lot of like fucking insane Canadian commercials and, and whatever else. And, you know, Seb Mall just streamed fucking 70 hours of Florida local Florida commercials and, and Ray Romano and all the, the, all this sort of stuff that would be a very good way to, you know, you could chop up a lot of that. That's a lot of very, uh, you, you could chop up a lot of that stuff and you could make a Florida based DVD out of that right now. Um, if you had the time to, uh, to cut it all up, I think you could, you could do that. Um, I have a lot of clips that I have been saving from a variety of sources. That's been the interesting thing. One, the only, no, that, one of the interesting thing about having kids is that you find yourself watching a lot of kids TV. And so I have a ton of shit that has come from episodes of Mr. Rogers. That, you know, some of it's pretty well-worn territory and I'm sure some people have seen this stuff, but like some Raffy clips and other shit that I think in, in the greater context of a larger thing would be would be pretty good. And I've been like setting those clips aside. There's an up speaking of Keith David, Keith David had a brief run on Mr. Rogers. I did not know this until we were watching them and he just turned up and he turned up to repair a donkey Kong machine. Like they're at the fucking bakery and Mr. Rogers goes over and goes like, there's a kid playing donkey Kong on an arcade cabinet and there's a centipede machine sitting next to it. And Mr. Rogers talks to the kid about video games for a little while. It's like, when I push the button, he jumps and does this and, you know, and, and whatever else. And then, but the point of the segment seems to be largely to get the kid to say, I like these games, but I also like to play outside, you know, kind of an everything in moderation sort of approach. But partway through, someone comes up to service the machine and open it up. And, you know, he kind of opens up the the top of the cabinet and pushes the buttons so you can see the stuff moving on the inside and it's literally Keith David. Keith fucking David shows up to to service this Donkey Kong machine, the coin box, all of this stuff and he shows Mr. Rogers the inside of a Donkey Kong cabinet. Um, and then he's part of the land of make-believe on a handful of episodes. Like he had a bit of a run there which is crazy. Crazy. But yeah. Um, that is one of the clips I set aside. Going like, this is, oh man, this Keith David, Mr. Rogers, this is wild. I got to save this. Um, but yeah, I don't know. I I, I think uh, everything is terrible. Has done some really good, and, and there's a bunch of individuals that contribute to everything is terrible, and some of them do their own stuff on the side too. And the, I assume the found footage festival still exists in some capacity. Um, but uh. Yeah, I don't know. For, uh, for my money, I don't think anyone has done it. I, I think in, in terms of just like the quality of the footage and, and now in this era, and of course it would be like this, uh, a lot of this, more and more of this footage feels like it's being sourced off of YouTube. And it's people going like, look at this funny shit I found on YouTube. And um, that's cool too. I, I it's, It just feels like a different thing. Again, I think be, because... Beckles is from Canada and he had access to all this. He recorded all of this Canadian television that is just some of the most embarrassing stuff. It's the first place I saw the Bret Hart fucking pizza pizza commercial and all of this other stuff. Um, yeah, I don't know. I, I think that, that 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 stuff is is fucking like all the fucking McCain's ads and everything. Yeah, there's just a lot of good shit. Uh, in TV Carnage, uh, and so I think yeah, those those last not maybe not the workout one, but TV Carnage three, like Casual Fridays, um, and whatever the one that came after that, that was it a uh, a sore for sighted eyes? Is that the last one? I, I forget, but great local commercials, all of it chopped up uh, in all of it chopped up in fun creative ways, um. 
Awkward Loser in the chat brings up a good point here. Yeah, new cringe is hard because we're at the point where people become became self-aware 20 years ago. Yeah, like that. Yes, like kind of. Yeah, like there's. Yes. It's a little different now. And, and, you know, television is different than it used to be. Um, And so local commercials aren't really a thing the way they used to be. And so a lot of that stuff has just kind of gone away. And so. But like, I think sourcing stuff from YouTube videos are just like, yeah, it's, it's just not, not as interesting. Uh, yeah. And of course, yes, Derek Beckles went on to do totally for teens, which is an amazing pilot. And then eventually a show called mostly for millennials, which is also funny. Um, and then last time I saw him, he was, he is on, I don't know if the show is still on some kind of prank show that was on network television. Network television is fucking scary. Uh, it was a prank show that had Johnny Knoxville and Eric Andre. And uh, yes, the prank panel, that is what it is called. I saw half of an episode of that not that long ago. And, uh, Derek Beckles was one of the like actors showing up and, you know, kind of a punked style situation, which I wish someone would do that to me. And then Derek Beckles would show up and I'd be like, Hey, the TV carnage guy. Why are you here pretending to be a cop? Um, you're the person I want to talk to the most out of anyone on this set. <laughs> um, anyway, uh, yeah, it's it's fucking bizarre. Uh, but yeah, I, I still I think the TV carnage stuff is still as uh, as disgusting as it gets. Um, David from York in the United Kingdom writes in and says, with Modern Warfare 3 now a $70 release, which Activision did confirm uh, that the upcoming game will indeed be a full-priced $70 video game. Uh, with MW3 now a $70 release, but still integrating some or most of the content from the last game, do you think they'll change enough to keep you interested? I jumped back into the new season after not playing for months, but I was quickly bored with the existing maps and gameplay, just not sure I'll get more than a couple of days of renewed interest out of it if it feels like a $70 map pack and a bit more lackluster story with too many stealth sections. Uh, yeah, I, I think that that's, uh, that, that's, uh, it, a lot of that is going to depend on your appetite for more Call of Duty. I think that, uh, Modern Warfare 3 kind of, um... You know, it, you saw that they renamed the Call of Duty entry on Steam and elsewhere to just say Call of Duty instead of Call of Duty Modern Warfare 2. And they, they, you know, intending to kind of merge these games in a way that they have been leading up to for a while, but never quite pulled the trigger on. And so we'll see. I think that this is something that doing that allows them to kind of update Warzone in place instead of leading to the situation where they had with Warzone 1 and Warzone 2 where now they're about to shut Warzone 1 down in like a month and a half or something. Um, now it's more of a traditional live game with the Battle Royale stuff. And so one would then assume that they want to create one launcher and then going forward, they just sell you a full game's worth of stuff and it all kind of goes into that same launcher so that they can kind of keep the Battle Royale part up to date and as part of that process. One would hope that this leads to a situation where content doesn't expire. But I don't think that that'll be the case. What they're saying for this year is that, you know, hey, all the shit you bought for Modern Warfare 2 will come into Modern Warfare 3. It'll still be there. The guns will still work. You can level them up in both guns. But you cannot take Modern Warfare 3 guns and Modern Warfare 3 stuff back into Modern Warfare 2. So the Modern Warfare 2 people and guns and whatever, you can still level them up in the new game. But if you buy Modern Warfare 3, you cannot pull those things back into the previous game. There are probably a number of reasons for them doing this. Because if they had to balance that game forever, like let's say they, let's say, you know, two years is one thing, but let's say they go five years of this. Let's say they have five Call of Duty games all of them feeding into one pool for the battle royale stuff and everything else. And they have to keep all of these people and all of these guns, more importantly, and all of this equipment and tactical whatevers 
and try to keep as much of it as possible from game to game. I think that's limiting to them creatively, but also from a balance perspective, it becomes a fucking mess. Like that's a Skylanders situation almost. Which, you know, if you remember how Skylanders handled things, it was not great. Uh, every year they would sell new Skylanders, but their whole pitch was, you can use the old Skylanders. And you're like, of course you can. Oh, great. Okay. I, and and sure enough, you can use your first generation Skylanders on the entire run of games that they eventually made. But every year, there was one new thing that that year's Skylanders could do that the previous years could not. And so it was like, well, this year's Skylanders, they have wow, pow, super power ups. And the old Skylanders, you can use them, but they have a level cap of 10. And current Skylanders can go up to level 20. So, I, you know, you can do whatever you want, but, uh, you know. And so they they held true to their word of bringing old Skylanders into the modern games. They were just less effective and less interesting to use than the modern Skylanders. Now, when you apply this to guns, I think you end up in a situation where you're just like, oh yeah, you can bring your old guns into the game, but like the meta is built around these five guns over here and um, your old guns kind of suck now in Warzone or in whatever else. There's a lot of just balanced stuff that becomes a mess there. So I, I, I don't expect that they will maintain this kind of single pool for items and, and characters and everything else in perpetuity. I would not be shocked if like we get Modern Warfare 3 and then they're like, cool man, that's it. Clean break. Here's the Black Ops. Here's the, We've rebooted Black Ops yet again uh, and uh, we are resetting Warzone and none of your shit comes in. Or like a very limited set of your shit comes in. And it does not include Snoop Dogg because our license with him has expired. Um, so yeah, I, we'll, we'll, we'll wait and see what this is, but you know, I, I saw, I saw some guy who was wildly wrong. Um, who was just like a lot of people in the call of duty community are mad because this means that they're going to eventually stop selling a game every year and they're all going to be the same and they're all going to be this. And it's like, Brother man, if you are worried about Call of Duty seeming the same year in, year out, where have you been for the last 15 years? Now they are saying that there's, you know, there's, there's discussion around changes that Modern Warfare 3 will have in its multiplayer around how the mini-map works and how, you know, like, oh, they're bringing back slide canceling, they're bringing back red dots on the mini-map and all the stuff that they did for the casuals in Modern Warfare 2. I, I don't know. I don't, you know, I don't know what the fucking point of that is. Like, I feel like Modern Warfare and Modern Warfare 2 hit a pretty good stride overall in terms of uh, heading in the right direction and, and, and making um, a good, fun, competitive multiplayer game. Again, I don't give a shit about esports or any of that aspect of the game. So I think that, like, skewing the game in that direction is a net negative. Um, and so I'd be curious, like, who are those changes for? If they're just like, we're making it hardcore again. Like, if that ends up being the pitch, and I think they're supposed to announce it this week, right? Um, like, they've already said what it is, but I think there's supposed to be some big reveal in-game uh, in a couple of days here. So maybe we'll know more then. But I just kind of look at it as like, I, you know, this is like, a, yeah, this is a big mainstream game that sells millions of units every year like don't skew it in favor of fucking dorks skew it in favor of normal people who just like to play that game i don't know um yeah were they afraid of x defiant they're like x defiant's gonna come in and out hardcore us they're gonna eat our lunch oh no like that's not it's not gonna happen not going to happen but um, anyway, to, to get back to the question of just like, yeah, is this going to be worth $70? I think that's an individual question for individuals to answer themselves, right? Like, I like the idea of a Call of Duty that doesn't fucking have to fully reset every year from the perspective of occasionally I would like to play a match on some of those older maps from last year's game or the year before that or whatever. Like the idea of a larger map pool to me is great because some of those maps I'm burned out on right now, 
but if I, you know, six months down the line, I had like, here's like 12 more maps and then we're releasing more maps with each season and blah, blah, blah. Like if I had all of those maps to choose from and all of those maps to maybe come up in a multiplayer hopper, that'd be great. Because the thing that it needs overall, I think, is more maps. Less repetition on the maps. Um, I would love it if they brought the Modern Warfare 1, the, the game from a few years ago, the recent one, if they brought those maps into the current Call of Duty pool. I would have loved to have those maps stay current because there's some really great maps in that game. Uh, that are just kind of gone now until they bring one of them back and go like, remember this one? It's rust. And you're like, yay. Like, you know, um, yeah, I don't know. I, I would, if, if all of the old maps were just there and then the developers spent time working on new maps, not gussied up remakes of old maps. That'd be cool. Just put five versions of Nuketown in the game. All of them. Put all the versions of Nuketown in there. Fuck it. Like, don't put them in your main multiplayer hoppers, but put them in there for fun. Put the seven different versions of shipment you have made into one game if you can. You know, and that's the sort of thing, like, are, how compatible are those maps? Did they change, you know, like the, the scaling unit size, you know, player size in the engine changed? And so these walls would, you know, there's a ton of work we'd have to do to make it work in modern Call of Duty, blah, blah, blah. You know, there's probably a ton of weird shit around that that would just break. Uh, it's not as easy as just like drag map file over onto patch and you know, you can't, you know, that doesn't fucking work. Uh, it's not, it's not that easy. I'm sure. But, um, but I, I, I would love to see that happen. Um, but we'll, we'll see. I don't know. I like the, the, the we'll see is not something we'll know this year. Right. Like they'll put this year's game out and we'll learn some things about how they intend to integrate things into one launcher, but it's not going to be until we get another year down the line and some other studio is now coming to it and they're like, oh, well, we're, you know, like what do they do with Warzone? Does Warzone just become a, a the centerpiece of this launcher and it's a separate team working on it and they're working with whoever is making the annual shit to make sure that the characters and guns and whatever integrate into Warzone properly like, I, you know, I don't know. There's a lot of moving pieces there, uh, obviously. And it's hard. It, it seems very fucking hard <laughs> to, to do all of that work or as much as I think people like deride them as like, Oh, they just rubber stamp a new game out every year. Blah, blah, blah. There's a thing people always say about Tony Hawk and you know, it, it was like, Oh, it's like Madden. Like, no, the field in Madden doesn't change year to year. I mean, they, they, they do graphical changes. They change it. But like at the end of the day, we got to make a hundred yard field. Can we make the grass look better this year? No, we don't have time. Maybe next year. Okay. Whatever. Call of duty. They change everything, but the, you know, it's like, yeah, it's a guy looking down this fucking site with guns, but then everything around it changes. Tony Hawk was the same way when people would fucking say like, oh, Tony Hawk's just another dumb annual sports franchise. It was just like, no, Tony Hawk's a fucking platformer that happens to come out every year with an entirely new set of levels. It's like if they put out a fucking new Mario game every fucking October. You know, it's like, it's not the, it's not even fucking close to the same thing. Like you're, you're being willfully ignorant. If that is the thing that you are fucking saying about it, um, like a totally different situation. So I, yeah, I don't know. I, I, long story short, I would love to see all this shit exist in one launcher forever. I would love to see them do the work to actually bring the shit from the old games into that launcher. They did say as part of their change, they're like, Hey, this is where call of duty lives except for every Call of Duty we've made before this one. Those are going to be over there. But going forward, this is what, you know, like they're intending it as, as a go-forward thing. Which I assume signals some kind of change for them in terms of how they view Warzone. Like, you could take it that way. Um, because I, I remember hearing the stories from people who were at the company that, like, that Kodak primarily viewed Warzone as like a demo and all he was concerned about was selling $60 now $70, but you know, $60 copies of call of duty. And the idea of war zone is this free to play thing. He was just like, ah, like just didn't understand it or something. And it was like, that's yeah. Okay. Whatever that gets more people to buy the game than great. 
And so for the first few years of Warzone 1 and everything else, it was really thought of as like this add-on thing that was there to hopefully get people to buy the real game as opposed to that's the real game now and everything else is kind of like, oh yeah, I guess we're selling, I guess there's still millions of people that want to play this too. Yeah, I don't know. I don't know, maybe, maybe some monetization scale went over to the other side over the last 12 months or so where they're like, okay, we are now making more money on Snoop Dogg skins than we are on uh, selling Vault Edition Call of Duties. So uh, let's let's unify this shit. Who knows? I'm sure there's a pitch deck somewhere about it. Uh, ben in Boston writes in, the launch of the PS5 and Xbox Series consoles. It's funny that there's still no good way to refer to the current Xbox generation. I would have just referred to it as the Xbox, but because of actually what, what some of this email is getting into, because of the long overhang on cross-gen Xbox One to Xbox Series to PS4 to PS5 stuff, because that lasted longer than normal, we have not quite been able to just say, oh yeah, the Xbox. Which is not how I thought it would go, but here we are. Uh, anyway, the, the launch of those consoles saw what felt like a longer than usual cross-gen period. Assuming Nintendo's next console is similar enough to the Switch to allow it, do you think we'll see another long cross-gen period after its launch? The Switch has sold a lot of units after all. Will Nintendo want to take advantage of that to keep selling games to all those users, or will they want to move people to the new system as soon as possible? Um... I think that Nintendo's own development will move over. I think that they'll they'll potentially have some cross gen stuff, but I think I I suspect that they will move their shit over fairly quickly. You could see some third parties um trying to have their cake and eat it too, appealing to the large user base of the Switch while also you know, putting out games on the other thing. I don't know that we end up in a I I, I don't know that we end up in a situation where buying one copy of a game gets you the game in both places. I don't know that Nintendo will bother to do that. Um, I don't know that it, I don't know that they personally have enough games that would be caught up in that kind of window of like, Oh, well it's gotta, if you buy one, it's, it's up, it upgrades automatically on both or blah, blah, blah. Um, I don't know that they end up doing some kind of thing like that. I could see them very easily being like, no, if you want the fucking Switch 2 version, buy the Switch 2 version. And maybe they do some discounted or free upgrades if they're going to take some existing... Like, like, let's say they want to take Splatoon 3 for whatever reason. And they're like, hey, uh, we're going to do a year of DLC for this thing. Um, Maybe there's a scenario there where they're like, oh, if you're a member of our thing, you'll get the upgraded Splatoon 3 for free, or you can buy it for 15 bucks and it comes with this additional add-on. And now it's Splatoon 3 Deluxe, you know, something similar to what they did for Mario Kart, almost. Um, but yeah, I, I don't, I don't see Nintendo being, um... I guess friendly is what I might say. I don't, I don't see Nintendo really going down that road of, of, of doing the kind of cross gen free upgrade, blah, blah, blah. But I also like looking at their software lineup and what we know of it anyway, you know, obviously, you know, there's, there's surely some unannounced things. Um, I don't know that there's that much stuff on their calendar that they would do as a free upgrade instead of just like, Hey, we're going to sell it here and then we're going to sell it here. Um, they seem like a company that would love to sell you, yes, an, an upgrade or an upgraded version of the game. And maybe they do a thing where it's like, hey, if you bought, well, let's say Metroid Prime 4 comes out on the existing Switch for fun. Um, they do that. And then, you know, six months, nine months later, the new console comes out. Is there a scenario where they say, hey, uh, we'll upgrade this for you. I don't think there is. I, I, I think instead they'll just be like, yeah, if you want to play Metroid Prime 4, buy it. It run, and, and maybe it runs slightly better there. Maybe it's like, oh, you know, yeah, you'll get a frame rate benefit, a frame rate bump or something 
you know, because of the additional power here, but it's not like they built it from the ground up for the new system and blah, blah, blah. Uh, yeah, I, I could see a situation where like this game technically runs better on the new thing, but we didn't necessarily go out of our way to make a, a, a native version for our new hardware. I, I, I don't see them making a lot of games for both. Um, we'll see. Yeah, an, an updated Tears of the Kingdom would be a moneymaker for them, for sure. If they said, oh yeah, we're gonna... Yeah, that, that got updated. This frame rate's great now. You gotta buy it. Um, Paul from Cut Off Louisiana writes and says, I will never forget the first time I saw a game running in high def on a flat screen. The game, Call of Duty 2. The console, the Xbox 360. It was at Best Buy. To me, that was a giant leap forward for console gaming. The clarity, the speed of the game, the brightness of the sandy environments, it all blew my mind. When was the first time you saw a game running in high def? Hmm. Uh, high 10 Saturn for the fucking... Uh, or uh, High 10 Bomberman. You know, the, the HD widescreen Bomberman, baby. Um... I know the first Xbox 360 game I saw running was Full Auto. Sega's Full Auto. Um, but I'm trying to think if that is also probably the first game I saw running. And well, I mean, you know, high, high def is a, a pretty, you know, if, ex, original Xbox games ran in 720p. So... And they ran in 1080i in some cases as well. So, I, you know, that's probably technically what we're talking about here is, uh, is something on the original Xbox. I suppose. Um, it was not on a flat screen. I had a, I still have my Sony Wega, big old nine trillion pound 16 by nine CRT apparently valued by players who love to rip the tubes out of them and put them in beat mania cabinets. Um, uh, but yeah, that, that TV supported 1080 I that, that TV supported 720 P all of that stuff. So I, I was playing burnout, uh, revenge, I guess. Like I was, yeah, I was playing burnout games three and four or whatever on an Xbox in HD back then before the 360. So yeah, it was not a ton of games that would support it. You know, you'd you'd have PS2 games that supported 480p, which I don't think we would necessarily call high def here. Um Yeah, yes. Rad Jago says I saw Quake running on an SGI at 1600 by 1200 in the mid 90s. Like, yeah. Yeah, I mean that's probably it's probably something to that as well. Um Harris writes in to say, hello, good, and how are you? And also, on a recent road trip through Texas, I stopped off at a media store in a small town along my route and was shocked to find that a good amount of their retro stock was still new despite being many generations out of date. I didn't buy anything, but discovering a hidden place where sealed PlayStation 1, Xbox, and even Super Nintendo games sat on the shelves was a really neat experience. Have you gotten any hold of any new old stock that you're particularly proud of? I remember there was a discovery of a warehouse full of brand new Dreamcasts in the early 2010s that sold for about 30 bucks each, and I'm forever bummed that I heard about that like the day after. Um. Well, so the, I mean, the, the Sega had their fire sale internally when Sega was cleaning out closets uh, when they were in the Townsend Street building that we were in, in the... I guess early, this would be early 2000s because this was kind of like near the end of the Dreamcast. Um, but it was some Saturn games and some other stuff. They had a bunch of sealed shit and I bought like three sealed copies of Shenmue and I bought like, they, they had some loose stuff that was open. So I bought like three Genesis CDXs off of them for like 20 or 30 bucks each. Um, and vmus and and millennium dreamcast controllers kind of new in box sealed and and there was a ton of shit i should have gone to the atm and gotten more money and come back and bought more shit it was dumb uh that i did not go as in as i could 
Um, there was also the cave. Um, there was some cave full of Atari 2600 games and some 7800 games. Um, this is, yeah, I, I don't, I'm, I'm going to try and look this up so I can kind of get the details right. Uh, Atari 2600 games found in cave. No. There was, I don't, I don't know. There was a, uh, yeah, there, there, anyway, there was, okay, here we go. Yeah. O'Shea Limited, back in 1990, stashed 3 million sealed Atari games. This is according to GameDeveloper.com. They, they put those games in a cave in 1990, and they've been selling them ever since. It's a limestone cave in Missouri. Uh, O'Shea Limited was bought all of these copies. of It's like, it's a limited number of games, but they had a fuck ton of them. Joust, Galaga, Tower Toppler, Pole Position, Ms. Pac-Man, and other kind of just like regular ass games. For the Atari 2600 and 7800. Um, and they stored them. Yes. Okay. 150 feet underground in a warehouse built from the unused space of a limestone mine. And they fucking filled it up here. Yeah. They, and they just say we've, uh, O'Shea says we've been in the closeout business for many years. We were notified by Atari that they were selling everything off. And so they just bought Atari's entire inventory and stored it in a fucking cave. And they have been selling games out of these, this cave I think they, I bet they still are. This interview is from 2009. I bought these games years before that. Um, and yeah, uh, how did the last question is, how do you decide to raise, how do you decide to raise the prices on these games? I see you've gone from $2 to $5 in the past few years. The cost to store and maintain the games has considerably increased since we first purchased the inventory in the early nineties. And it got to a point where we had to increase the price a few years ago to maintain a reasonable profit. Cave price is going up. You can't keep shit in a cave like you used to. But yeah, I, so I ordered a ton of shit out of the, from the cave people. And they uh, they sent me a bunch of... I left all of it sealed, which is dumb because it's not like it's rare because they've got a cave full of it. Um, But I still have sealed copies of Galaga and Ms. Pac-Man and all of this other shit. That's probably the weirdest new old stock uh, that I have purchased. Um, and it was very cheap. I think it's probably still pretty cheap. I don't know, but that's, uh, my guess is that they still, um, let's see. Let's see if this website is still up. Yep. O'SheaLTD.com. Atari classics video. Oh, Hey, it's sold out. Apparently, uh, Apparently they, they have not, well, I don't know. There's the, it said sold out and then I clicked on the page and there's still, well, and I clicked on the order form and now it just says potential security risk ahead and Firefox is not letting me visit the site. Cause it is a, this site, is, this site is being served from a fucking cave. Um, anyway, I don't know if, the, I don't know if the games exist in the cave anymore or not. You'd have to find out. Uh, but yes, my, my, my Atari games from the cave are probably the weirdest new old stock that I have found my way into. Uh, let's make this last question. Nathan from Tumwater, Washington writes and says, if you could live anywhere in the world, where would you live? Hmm. I don't know. Um, this, this is a very, you know, this, this is a question that I think is, uh, uh, determined by kind of where you're at in life. And so for me, when I am thinking about where I want to live and, and trying to weigh out, like, am I where I should live now, or should we be thinking about moving somewhere else or whatever, all of it is based around the kids and raising a family and like, what's going to be the safest best place to live. And I don't know what the answer to that is anymore, you know, because that becomes like, okay, where's going to be a good place for these kids to go to school? What's got good schools. And then also, you know, like we were talking about earlier, there's, you know, the healthcare stuff, like, and, uh, the state of the country, the state of the nation is that, you know, is, is it, is it time to think about, uh, 
know, there was, yeah, at one point it was like, wait, is New Zealand nice? I don't know. Is New Zealand, I hear good things about New Zealand. I don't know. Um, or like, I don't know, Ireland seems like it'd be fun. I, I, for me, my needs are, you know, especially now that I'm kind of working for myself and, and, and everything there, it's like, I just kind of need fast internet and I need to be close to an airport. Um, the minute I left, if I left the country, we, we talked about Canada as well. You know, I, I, I think it would, might be, maybe it would be fun to live somewhere outside of Vancouver. I don't know. I haven't really done the research. It seems nice. Um, but, um, yeah, New Zealand would be a real crazy, yeah, you, to going anywhere from Van, from New Zealand would be a, a trek. Um, yeah, everyone, yeah, the people in the chat are saying Vancouver is expensive as hell, even on the outskirts. It's like, dude, I don't know, man. I lived outside of fucking San Francisco, and now I live outside of Los Angeles. It's, Vancouver cannot be worse than those. <laughs> Uh, but yeah, I don't know. Do you, you end up in Belgium someday? I, I fuck, I don't know. Like maybe that would be cool, but uh, but I, I don't know. So you know, I, I don't, I don't necessarily think that like leaving the country is 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 the right move. Maybe at some point that will seem more right. In years previous, at some point that seemed more right than it is now. But um. But, uh, yeah, I don't know. Yeah. It's just, Chrononaut says, Hey, if you don't want living to be so expensive, might I suggest living literally anywhere but California? Yeah. It's definitely, you know, when we first were talking about moving, that was the thought was it's time to get the fuck out of California. Um, but then you start to look at like, Oh, well, okay. I'm like now we're, we are, we are raising a family. We are raising kids. We do want good schools. We do want, you know, like they're the things we want out of a, a location. California actually checks a lot of those boxes, um, or at least the, the areas that we have been in. And so, you know, leaving California becomes a lot harder when you start taking those sorts of other things into account. Um, but I would love to live somewhere that was super cheap where our money went a lot further and, and all of that. I think that would be great if I was alone and, you know, had like, if I was just like me or whatever, I would probably, I would love to spend some time living in Tokyo. I don't know if, I don't know if I could live there forever. Um, but, um, yeah, I don't know. I, I, I would have, I, I thought I, I think living in Tokyo would be fucking cool as fuck. Um, But yeah, you know, that's not, <laughs> that, that's not a, that's not a viable scenario for me right now with, uh, with three kids and, and all that stuff. So, so no, um, so yeah, I don't know. Yeah. You just, yeah. Pick a, pick a town that, uh, Google fiber went to and, you know, and get your, your five gig, your 10 gig, whatever you can get. Anapros says Albany, Georgia, they got 10 gig home fiber. That sounds great. Yeah. At one point it was like, what about. North Carolina or what about outside of Raleigh or something like that? And I don't know, like how were the mosquitoes there? I don't know. <laughs> it's, all of it just sounds fucking crazy. So I, yeah, I, I don't know. I don't know. I, for a while, like my first thought when, when I was like, these fires are bad, we need to move. My first thought was Illinois. My first thought was like getting something outside of Chicago because it was at a time, you know, I was like, I knew people that lived in that area and I was like, oh, that'd be fun to, you know, like, that seems like that would be kind of a, a cool spot. I don't know. Um, I would love to move somewhere North where it's going to be a little cooler. So that kind of like Southern fucking heat doesn't sound fun. Um, not that it's cool here. I don't know. And we're, we're going to get close to fire season. We'll see how stuff goes and blah, blah, blah. Yeah. I don't know. No place is great at the end of the day. I think that's, that's probably the, uh, Minnesota. I have, I have heard, uh, there's, yeah, I've, I've seen stats on like the Minneapolis area that made it sound really good in a lot of different ways. Um, 
but you know, I, I don't know. It, it's not something I spent a bunch of time thinking about. Like we, it feels like we just moved here. And so I, I, I'm, I don't want to fucking pack anything up and go anywhere. God damn it. Um, but, uh, we'll see. It's definitely something that we, we do talk about as a family from time to time. It's just like, eh, you know, like, and my wife is like sending me photos of like houses in Maine that look fucking beautiful, like just great. Just like they look fucking awesome. But I'm like, I don't know, man. Every person I've ever heard that lived in Maine said it was bad. <laughs> like I, I don't know that I've heard great things about Maine um, from people who lived there. Um, so I, yeah, I don't, I don't, I don't really know what to, what to make of all of it, but, um, but yeah, I don't know. At some point, you know, maybe it'll make more sense to move than it does right now. And, and we'll think about it again, but, but yeah, I, I don't, uh, I don't, I don't really, yeah, I don't know that I, I, California is great with a lot of things. Like California is actually a really fucking awesome state. Um, in terms of, you know, some of the climate, um, some of the political climate as well, parts of it anyway, uh, that's getting a little sketchy depending on where you go. Um, and there's just, I don't know, there's, but, uh, but I think there's, there's a lot to like about California in so far as like, it is still this massive economy. It is still this, you know, uh, like there is still a lot of beautiful terrain and stuff around here. And, and, you know, there still are a lot of really nice places to live. It just, you know, I think there's just parts of it that I'm super fucking done with. Um, you know, there's parts of Northern California, like I, you know, whatever I was born and raised in Northern California. I, st I think it's a great place to live. Generally speaking, I just, we got done with it a lot because of the fires. And it was just like, man, PG and E is fucking not replacing all of this, like the power company by the way, uh, feels like they get blamed for every one of these fires. And it's always like, yeah, they had old equipment here and then a tree fell on it. And guess what? Everything burned for a month. And you're like, fuck, what the fuck? So like part of it, I, I really, I almost fucking, I kind of broke down a little bit, you know, like I, I kind of got to a point where I was just like, I've got to get out. Like it, it felt irresponsible to stay because it just felt you know, like the power company was going to fucking kill us all, you know? Um, and I think the answer is infrastructure around the nation is dog shit. And I think that a lot of that shit is fucking bad. And, um, and, and so you, you know, there's, you, you, you kind of, it's, it's hard to get away from all of that sort of stuff. Yeah. I remember. Yeah. PG and E blew up that fucking neighborhood and they had the fucking gas lines explode. Uh, was who, uh, Hillary, didn't Hillary Goldstein live there? Anyway, as a former IGN, I want to say he might've been on that court. So, somebody, somebody in games lived on the street that blew up. Um, but, uh, yeah, I don't know. That shit sucks. And it, and it, and it kind of sucks everywhere. Uh, infrastructure is, you know, yeah, it's one of those things you just look at and go like, oh yeah, no one wants to do it. And it's, it's like, everything is going to shit around us. Like they, you know, they occasionally pave the roads. Like those are the things that are frustrating. Cause you look at it and go like, oh, this is, you know, the, we talk all about, especially in California, we talk all about how, like, oh, this is the fourth biggest economy in the world. It's bigger than Germany, you know, whatever, you know, whatever fucking thing that they're touting out there. Um, and you're like, yeah, that's cool, man. The infrastructure still kind of sucks here. Like it's, you know, there's still a lot of places with fucking awful internet. There's still a lot of places with, uh, extremely bad roads. There are a lot of places with just, you know, extremely old power infrastructures that are susceptible to all sorts of natural disasters as well as attacks from outside. You know, there's just a lot of stuff you just look at and go like, this shouldn't be a thing. When, when you look at the way people talk about not just California, but America, um, and how great it is and how we, we can, it's like fucking, then why are all these rural hospitals closing? 
And you, you can find out the answer why. We don't, we don't need to get into it. The point is, it doesn't need to be this way. And there are too many people making too much money off of the way things are. And something needs to be done about those people one way or the other before we can fucking get anything that's going to fucking fix anything for real people. Um, be that healthcare, infrastructure, whatever. Run it down the list. Eventually it all fucking traces back to the same exact fucking problem. And that's why I want to be your governor. Like I said, we do spend some time thinking about moving. <laughs> Whether it's somewhere else here in the in the continental United States, or like, hey, let's uh, let's get to Canada, which Canada doesn't. I don't know. Parts of Canada sound fucking super bad, <laughs> to be honest. Uh, and uh, who? I don't know. I don't know. I think I might be Irish enough to technically qualify for Irish citizenship. I, and who knows? I don't. I've, that, I've not done any research on if Ireland is a great place to live or not either. But I, I don't know. I move over there. Get Danny O'Dwyer to move over there. We'll get a barn. Turn it into a big video studio. Um. Anyway, that's that's gonna do it for the podcast. Um, let's see. Gosh, uh, so I'm trying to figure out what this week's schedule should be um, because this Friday the pre-order beta for Mortal Kombat One will begin, uh, and so I am thinking that we will play that on Friday if you've got access to that perhaps we could play together I don't know what the I'm guessing the matchmaking will not be it'll just be random it sounds like they're adding a couple of characters that were not in the tech test uh, two playable characters one cameo I think that is what they're adding so maybe we'll play some of that um, and uh, we'll we'll see how that holds up um and so that means, so I was thinking that Friday would be our NES day, but if Mortal Kombat is going to happen on Friday, then perhaps we will do NES games tomorrow, um, which I have not posted on the Patreon yet about uh, uh, getting some suggestions for that, but uh, someone on the Discord suggested a few and uh, in the advisory panel channel, but I will I will ping the advisors and perhaps we will do a Wednesday stream for NES games uh, this time. And uh, that way we can, you know, that way we can do Mortal Kombat on Friday. As well as there's something else out. Um, uh, oh, uh, Bomb Rush Cyberfunk is out. In a few days here. Which is wild that that's finally coming out. So maybe that'll be a Friday thing as well. Um, we'll see how it all goes. We'll, we'll play that part of it by ear. But right now, I am leaning towards doing a Nintendo games tomorrow. Um, and then, gosh, so, the, so potentially we'll do that. And then we'll do this other stuff on Friday. And then uh, next Tuesday is the Gamescom opening show. So we'll probably do a shorter podcast. And then we will watch that stream live. Uh, and, uh, and see how that goes. See what kind of, again, three hours of farming Sims strap in fuckers we'll be back uh, next week for that. Uh, head on over to patreoncom slash Jeff Gerstman sign up. You get uh, access to more shows. You keep the, the, you keep this light on, you keep this fucking ring light on, keep the ring light lit. Um, you can get access to episodes of Game Boys to Men. We're looking to record the next episode. Finally got that scheduled uh, for later this week. And then the next episode of that will be about the first E3, which is a, an, a formative time in a lot of ways. Um, and uh, yeah, uh, the, the Jeff Gerson Hall of Fame episode uh, devoted to Rez is up now on Patreon for 
of those of you with early access to the Hall of Fame. And of course, you can hop on the Discord, chop it up, do your thing. We're hanging out, having fun, talking shit, as they say. Come on through, patreon.com slash Jeff Gerstman. We've got annual discounts. If you sign up for a year, you pay less? That seems like whoever does, whoever turned that on, this is a bad idea. Anyway, take care. Back tomorrow with uh, some video games, and then back on Friday with more video games, and then back on Tuesday with the podcast and all that other stuff. Until then, I am Jeff Gerstman, and I will see you soon. Bye.